Good morning, dear Nigerians, and welcome. Welcome to another thrilling edition of Breakfast Extra for a Sunday. Now, how's everybody faring out there? No, seriously, it's a serious question. Have you checked your health lately? Because in today's Nigeria, that's fast becoming the most important question to ask. If your blood pressure hasn't spiked along with the rising fuel prices, well, congratulations to you because you somehow managed to survive the Nigerian Olympics of economic stress, and for that, you deserve a medal. Or maybe a bottle of whatever magic potion you're sipping on. <laughs> and if you do have a magic bottle of whatever it is you're sipping on, that's if you've cracked the code to staying sane and healthy in this Nigeria of today. I beg of you, bottle it up and sell it. Because I promise you, you are in for a bouquet of customers from all across Nigeria, maybe even Africa. But wait, don't rush. Let me give you guys the lowdown. You see, with the skyrocketing prices of drugs these days, you might want to price it right. Because Nigerians are turning to everything from herbal remedies to divine intervention just to stay afloat. So your miracle cure could be the next big kit in alternative medicine. And trust me, you'll make a killing, literally. Only if you price it right. Not too high, not too low. Now, let's take a trip down memory lane, shall we? Come with me, ladies and gentlemen. Remember when we all groaned and cried during the Buhari rain, thinking things couldn't possibly get any worse? Oh, what sweet memories. And what sweet irony. If be careful what you wish for were a person, this administration would be a two-horned beast straight out of hell, complete with a pitchfork and a pair of wire-rimmed glasses flipping us over on the fiery grill of high inflation and endless petrol hikes. Now, how's that working for everybody out there? <laughs> Foreign, isn't it? But on a serious note, I sympathize with you all, dear viewers. I'm also suffering the same thing. We need hope now more than ever. Hope that somehow, somewhere amidst all this chaos of the regime we find ourselves in, there's a flicker of light at the end of this very long, dark tunnel. And maybe, just maybe, if we hold ourselves accountable, both as individuals and as a nation, we'll find a way out of this economic mess. And so, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls out there, on that note, let's dive into today's show and welcome you to Breakfast Extra. We've got the latest headlines from dailies coming up next. But first, I, Zeno Peel, would like to welcome my lovely co-host, Judith Atibi, on board before bidding you another welcome to Breakfast Extra, where we're going to guide you guys through the madness that is Nigeria while keeping a smile plastered on our faces like Judith's one here constantly Doing my for best. the next three hours. <laughs> <laughs> Judith, I have a song to start today's show. Do you want to oh, guess which one? Okay. Guess? Any guess? Um... It's Afrobeat. Nigeria. No, no, stop. Uh, 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 uh. Stop. No, it's 44 city, 99 standing. So freak and smiling. Thank you very much. <laughs> On that note, welcome to Breakfast Extra. <laughs> Thank you once again for joining us on this Sunday edition for Breakfast Extra. It's the last installment for the weekend. We'll be discussing many topics concerning the health of Nigerians, the rising cost in medicines, the moral decay and crime, as well as the return of the crisis in the PDP uh, in River State, where God, as you know, I mean, we came, <laughs> has declared no peace for anyone who supports uh, the Fubara-led government. And oh, we are in for some exciting times as well. Only if you stay with us through today's show, we'll also touch on a worrying health risk that often goes unchecked until too late amongst uh, Nigerian men. And you also get to find out these and more on the show this morning. And that's only if you do one thing, get out of bed, grab a cup of coffee or tea or whatever it is that you like in the morning, and come join us through the course of the show. But let's bring you the dailies this morning Oh, sir, did you just call Wicked God? And so far. I, Kimi, I know <laughs> you. you. I've, you I've just, been trying to move fast. Call my favorite scary and, uncle God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, I remember what I just said. I don't piss for anyone. He did it. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, 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 that's, that's got to be how God sounds. I promise Do it again. You. Do it again. So, if, say your if name you, in this if you want, if you don't want peace, you won't get peace. Did I get it right? <laughs> but I love him because he's got so much character. I mean, there's so much to unpack from comedy to 
how fierce a human being can be when it comes to Wiki. So I enjoy. Uh, uh, um, I think he's the quintessential Potaka's average man. He is the kind of uncle that your mother calls up in Potaka to come and beat you in Lagos. Yeah. Tell him I'm coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Boka. I'm you see that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I know who called me. <laughs> Let's do the dailies now for real. For real. For real this time. And, and we're um, starting off with a Saturday Independent. <laughs> yes. As we pull it up right for you there on the screen. The very first story that comes at you. Uh, CSOs predict trouble as a federal government fails to tame few crises. Analysts fault President's economic team. We will shut down streets in protest October 1st. TIB. That story is on page two. APC's nine years worse than PDP's 16 years. Lukman. That story is on page five. Lawyer seeks compensation for victims of gas leak in Aquaibum. You can find the story on page seven. Ban on Togo Bena Republic degrees. Stakeholders want Tunumbu's intervention. That story is on page six. Uh, masquerades attack APC campaign train in Edo. You can find that story on page eight. I would give anything to the see gods the gods must be crazy. I, must, I, I, I would give anything. I want, please, if you see. have a link to that video. <laughs> I would give anything. Sorry, this is the case of Shadden Forden, but I would love to see it in any case. It. That would be a fun uh, watch for a Saturday after, or Sunday afternoon. At the bottom there, protesters' treason uh, trial would be catastrophic. Concerned Nigerians warn, uh, ask FG to drop all charges against protesters' release team. That story is on page three. NDDC to release Niger Delta Integrated uh, Development Dev uh, Master Plan. You can find that story on day, page four. And uh, the last the last one there for, at the bottom. Insecurity, federal government to embark on massive police recruitment. And that's on Tunu. We can find that story on page 31. The Sunday Nation has got more headlines, none of them less interesting. Dangote free to fix petrol price, but no guarantee It'll be cheaper, says the NNPCL. I think I already kind of knew that that was going to be the yeah. case. I think in the case of uh, the Dangote refinery, it's a case of availability, mm -hmm. not price. Mm -hmm. Most Nigerians just want it at this point, want it now, and now is, is what they want. Yeah. Manufacturers lament new price regime. Ipman president, crisis will be over soon. Nance opts out of planned protest. At the very top, and a story that has been on everybody's thoughts since yesterday. President's, uh, presidency accepts Tinubu spokesperson Ngalali's resignation, says his privacy should be respected. Very fine young man, um, followed <coughs> his um, media career <coughs> since from very early, and uh, the heights he got to, very interesting. And I am very curious as to what um, family health um, matters he is speaking of. But then again, we do respect his privacy. Of course. Uh, a man needs some space. Of Commuters course. stranded as petrol tanker explodes in Ibadan on page two. At the bottom here, Nigeria beats Bennett 3-0 in Afghan qualifiers. Woohoo, go team. And teen killers on the proud tragic rise of child cultists. Um, uh, then I had only 3,800 naira when I returned. $10,000 I found at Kano Airport, says Cleaner. Oh, that's sad because that was celebrated. I think he actually did get a compensation, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And nice. finally, IA Datiwa appoints 344 additional aids. <clears throat> now, um, right. moving on now. We're moving from... on now to Sunday Vanguard yes. uh, newspaper. And the first one that jumps at you there is uh, Petro uh, Pains. In fact, there's so much to, to catch up on on the Sunday Vanguard. But the first one that comes at you there, uh, Petro Pains. Tough times await parents, uh, students, uh, teachers as uh, schools resume. Providers, others advise uh, device in, in ingenious ways to survive. NUT seeks hardship allowance. We're not so distributor of Dangote refinery products and in PC. Uh, at, uh, at that's where he's on Let PC me help you out there with that one. At the top, you've got car owners abandoned vehicles by... Ooh, dude, this is an interesting one. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk about this for a second? Because sure. uh, the fact is that you're actually saving more if you're transporting just yourself. Mm -hmm. Motorcycles actually offer that liberty for you to simply use more, less fuel 
because you're just the only one on the vehicle. So mm -hmm. this was something that I saw coming because there's an increase in mm -hmm. the importation of scooters into Lagos State. Right. If you go to neighboring states, not Nigeria, Cotonou, for instance, you have so many scooters there. And in fact, now they've moved on to using electric scooters. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that I see coming into Nigeria. Electric scooters or electric vehicles might be the thing. Uh, that's only if you can charge it, but I guess everybody's got their own power. Uh, that's what you said is, uh, we use generator. Yeah, exactly. So uh, maybe that's a better alternative. But so, isn't this the same thing? Buy fuel, use generators, and then it's the same? I know. It's called an Ouroboros. It's, it's that snake that continues to go around and eat its own tail. So, Hi. Which comes first, chicken or the egg? Um, uh, let's move on now to the next newspaper, which is the Liberty, the Voice of Liberty newspaper here. Ah, uh, yeah, here we go. And the one that comes at you there, uh, of course, uh, still on a jury's, uh, a jury's uh, res resignation. And Galali's uh, resigns as uh, Tinubu's media. Anti-corruption enforcement will never work in Nigeria. You can find uh, that statement there is from the EFCC boss. Few price hike crucial for Nigeria's growth. And that's from Tinubu. Few price may skyrocket to 5,000 hour per letter. And that's from NLC. Uh, that NLC there being Nigeria Labour Congress. Dangote refinery free to sell petrol directly to any marketer. That story there is from that statement there is from NNPCL. Wiki a threat to national security democracy. Sit Rivers elders tell Tunumbu. Uh, Niger Delta communities demand investigation into illegal crude oil export. Alleged 70 billion naira theft. Matawale can't escape probe. EFCC assures Zamfara are uh, APC protesters. That story there. And all of these you can find on the Voice of Liberty. Yeah. And I think we could move on now to the Sunday Punch newspaper. Sunday Punch newspaper has got this headline on it. NNPC conditions. Dango to refinery may dump local market. Export petrol. That on page three. Why or rather we are ready to buy at any price, says marketers. And motorists crowd NNPC stations for fuel. At the top, treason charges against protesters, reckless lawyers, CSOs, knock FG. And Chinese firms didn't tell court seized planes where presidential jets, says Aundaka. To the side of the Punch newspaper front page this morning, anti-party, PDP panels gets a report on Wiki Autumn Mackinde. And food import waiver, others push Naira to new low. Decomposing bodies still litter our community after terrorist attacks, say survivors of Yobi massacre. Sad instance they find on page 9. And tales of women disabled by health workers. Negligence during childbirth on page 16 and 17. And heartbreaking stories of men damaged by paternity fraud. Money laundering, U.S. seeks access to ailing Binance executive. And now, right. what do we have? Yeah, the next one is the Sunday Telegraph. There we go. I will pull it up for you there. Why APC should be voted out in 2027 by Lukman. Uh, that story there is on page two. Says party failed in economic, economy, security, corruption. Governments, governments since uh, 2015 worse than PDP. Opposition, Oshibancha, fire me. Others must unite to save Nigeria. We will respond at appropriate time, ruling party. Tinubu accepts uh, Ngalali's uh, memo for indefinite leave. Now... This one about APC should be voted out in 2027. I have never seen in the history of our democracy. Oh, she's going to say it. Go on. <laughs> you know I'm saying, in go the on. history of our democracy, how in just under one year, mm. we are already like... Ready, the, we're done they're, with this They're done. It's like, we need to get to the... And it's like, well, your electoral process had flaws in the last time. We can talk about elections, 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 until you fix the process. Mm -hmm. the, be the beavers didn't work. Um, uh, to the bi that's the by model to get upload it so you could go to the general portal. It didn't work. There were, there were instant too many um, irregularities. irregularities with it. There was also voter apathy. There, was a, there, were, there were voters that were disenfranchised at the time. So there was a lot that happened with the system, with the elections as of from last year the general elections of last year, until we fix that and be able to see that the people are, they, th they trust the process and mm -hmm. trust the people in the process, we just relax, all right? Mm -hmm. Fix it, first of all. All right, I'm not going to argue with you. You know what I'm going to say? Remember what I started with in monologue? Mm. 
Be careful what you wish for. Because <laughs> you just might get it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's it for the dailies. <laughs> Coming up this hour, we're going to have our very first big report, and we're going to be talking about the rising costs in medicines and even healthcare. Do stay with us. We'll bring you the... In what made front page news from last week, elder statesman Edwin Clark has written a scathing letter to the Inspector General of Police calling for the arrest of the Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, Nyonso Wike. Clark accused Wike of treason over inflammatory remarks he made where he allegedly threatened to burn down certain states if provoked. Clerk's letter claims that Wike's behavior is unbecoming of a public official and poses a danger to Nigeria's democracy, urging the authorities to take immediate action. Now, at the heart of this crisis is the political turmoil brewing within River State and the wider PDP structure. Clark's concerns over Wike's unchecked influence, coupled with the accusations surrounding his vast wealth, have ignited... <clears throat> my apologies have ignited a national debate about accountability, public office, and political impunity. Now, these tensions also hint at the potential for deepening rifts within the PDP, which could have far-reaching consequences for the political stability in River State and also beyond. And so joining us today to delve deeper into the issue is Chibike Ikenga. He's the Publicity Secretary of the River State APC Caretaker Committee. Mr. King Ikenga has previously raised concerns about the governance of River State and is uniquely positioned to offer insights into the unfolding crisis. We also have with us Mr. Omar Sani. He is the former special advisor, media and publicity to former vice president, uh, um, architect Mohammed Namadi Sambu. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you. So, thank you so much and good morning. Good morning. So, gentlemen, uh, thank let's you for begin. having me and good morning to you all. Thank you very much, sir. Gentlemen, I want to begin by first of all finding out what your positions are. Edwin Clark has called for Wiki's arrest and also trial for treason over his remarks. Now, do you believe Wiki's actions justify such a strong response from Edwin Clark, or is this a, a political overreaction? Let me start with you, Mr. Ikenga. Thank you for having me once again. I think that uh, the non Nigerian is uh, overreacting, uh, premised on his frustrations about um, their conspiracies to push. Uh, the very strong politician out of uh, the presence of the um, uh, presence of the Tunibu-led government, particularly uh, the fact that um, the Pa Edwin Clark is uh, a clannish and ethnic-based politician who is uh, leveraging on the disagreement between Governor Sebi Fubara of River State and his benefactor, Chief Yeso Wike. And uh, because it has become very impossible for Pa Edwin Clark and cohorts to undermine the relevance of uh, the FCT minister in the PDP and generally in the policies of Nigeria, he chose to go that route to try to undermine him and make him look less important before the president of Nigeria and Nigerians. Now, Mr. Omar, if you've heard what Mr. Kenga said, um, how do you interpret um, Edwin Clark's remarks regarding treason on the side of the FCT minister, Nielsen Wike. Well, I, although I hold the same view with Mr. Ikenga over uh, the overreaction issue, but I differ with him in terms of the reasons that he advanced. I believe that the, uh, the elder statesman, Edwin Clark, overreacted by saying he should be ar arrested. Well, it, it goes contrary to the spirit and letter of the, our constitution, where, which gives you the right to express yourself, the right to free speech. However, what the security, it, it, security agencies ought to do was to invite him to come and explain to them what he meant by those words he uttered. If they are found to be uh, treasonable, you know, then the the police can take further action. However, if they are found to be a, a actions relating to provocation, because his structures were going to be taken away, and uh, he spoke, you know, you know, pro provocatively because he's very angry that uh, the governors have now 
united against him. That's a different matter altogether. But by and large, you know, putting it succinctly, it is not proper for the party not to, and for people who are who have loved the party not to react to certain things. Of course, Edwin Clark reacted because he felt that the party, you know, Wiki had undermined the party. And having undermined the party, he is now in a position enjoying the benefit of that action of undermining the party, you know, in, uh, within the APC. And of course, he had also made a declaratory remarks saying that in 2027, he was still going to undermine the party because he, he, he will still stand on the mandate. He will be with Jagaban. So that is an issue that should generate uh, anger within our party. And nobody hates Wiki, but we do not believe that our party that is trying to re-strategize, to be able to win both rivers and uh, the national election, should be undermined in the manner in which Wiki is doing. That is the reason why uh, people go against him and nothing more. So I have to ask you, Mr. Sani, giving uh, Wiki's very vocal position on where he stands, he's never hid where his support lies. He's never hid where his loyalty lies. In fact, he has used, he has been name calling uh, uh, members of the PDP, whether in the National Working Committee or high level officials of the PDP. He has been very vocal. He's insulted them and he's also threatened with his statement, threatened to set fire to states, to PDP governors uh, who support Fubara. And so I have to ask you, is the PDP ever going to make a stand against Wiki? And in, in the right of, uh, to, to make a case for Mr. Edwin Clark, for Sir El Ed Edwin Clark, is he overreacting if the leadership of the PDP refused to take a stand? Well, the leadership of the PDP cannot and will not refuse to take a stand because this is not a matter that is only left within the purview of the National Working Committee. This matter has to go to the National Executive Committee of the party and the party must take a position. You cannot have somebody who has made a clear statement that I will fight your, the party in 2027. And then you say, okay, we will not take any action. That is not uh, the, in the spirit of our party. One of the greatest treasure group within the party is the governor's forum. And the governor's forum, for the first time, initially it was left at the purview of uh, the former presidential candidate of the party, Atiku Abokar and Wiki, you know, sparring you know, verbally over the media space and fighting within the party uh, hierarchy. But now, one of the, the strongest uh, pressure group within the party, which is the Governor's Forum, are now united. And they are not only united, they are also unanimous that the leadership of the party in River State must be left to Fubara, who is the governor, and which is the, 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 the standard procedure within the PDP that the governor is the leader of the party. So uh, having taken that stand, of course, we can will be provoked because perhaps in some of them, he had had allies before, and now they are now jettisoning him and following due process. So uh, his reaction is uh, natural. It comes with uh, anger. I look at Mark Inde, who is my man. He is now still joining them. Look at... Uh, uh, the governor of Plateau State, whom I helped during the, uh, the 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 case in his case in the Supreme Court, is jettisoning me. They are all ganging up. Look at Fintiri, who is my friend. He's jettisoning. So Bala Mohammed has he used to be my friend. They are all leaving me. They are now you know drawing battle lines against me, and then they are now going to support somebody who has been disloyal to me, somebody whom I brought to become the governor, naturally, such actions of Wiki will naturally come into play. He will naturally be angry, but Edwin Clark's uh, frustrations and anger, I think are much more than the issue of Wiki, uh, you know, on this matter. I think Edwin Clark 
is summarizing his anger first because Edwin Clark is reputed to be the Jonathan's strong man during Jonathan's period. And being Jonathan's strong man, he has been working for the progress of Jonathan and so forth, so forth and so on. And he believes that Wiki has not given Jonathan his dues, being the person who actually helped him to become governor. And that he has insulted anybody who had crossed his path, including the person he said uh, is his uh, mentor. That is uh, Peter Odili and his wife. As he has also insulted his uh, very good friend, uh, which is Secondos, that they have come together. He has insulted most of the people around him. Uh, you know, uh, Osi Okwara, who was the deputy speaker, and so forth and so on, all of them. So these have, you know, naturally created, you know, a, a, a serious problem within the, 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 the PDP River State, and that the PDP River State is divided, you know, and those people that Wiki had sidelined are now, they team up together now, and they are supporting Kubara. And naturally, Wiki will also believe that, you know, one of the greatest treachery of Kubara is to bring those people whom he felt were against him, and now they are now part, part and parcel of him. So right. it's a very complex situation. All right. But I think, I think, I, I think the situation is now cooling off. Thank you, All sir. Right, Mr. Thank you so much, Mr. Sani. Let me uh, come to you, uh, um, uh, Mr. King, uh, and, and and just ask the question. Mr. Fubara, you said that uh, Fubara's statements are not, um, you don't see it as incitory. Does that mean that as opposition, you are in support of his statements? Weekly statements. Of Mr. Weekly's statement. Okay, quickly, let me respond to Sani. I think that uh, Sani made some uh, wide generalizations. I know that Sani and the names he mentioned in PDP, Edwin Clark, uh, Secondus, uh, Atiku, Abubaka, uh, to mention but a few of them, are very pained with Wiki's victory over them. Recall that these persons he mentioned, Sani mentioned, are the same people who went against the PDP constitution about rotational presidency. President Mohamed Buhari did eight years, and ordinarily presidency ought to return to the South. But these same characters he mentioned, including himself, supported that presidency should go back to the North, which Chief Nyes Onwike and like minds kicked against. And because of the bruises they sustained in that war, politically speaking, they have not forgiven Chief Yes Owike because he came out victorious. He tried to say what he wanted to do and was clear on it, and he defeated them fair and square. All the names that Sani had bandied around have become political uh, uh, featherweights in view of the emergence of Chief Yes Owike in their PDP. So, and the type of politics Chief Yes Owike had brought into being in Nigeria has never been seen before. It's quite unprecedented. And it's expected that envy, jealousy will come together. He's mentioning governors who were with uh, Chief Wicked before and who are no longer with him today. Those are things that he is conjecturing. They are neither here nor there because Chief Jason Wicked, at the time PDP collapsed completely, came to the rescue of PDP. And for that reason, had remained very strong. He has his own team in the PDP. He is a member of the PDP. And then when he came to the presidential election, he told them that if you fail to support a certain president, I was going to work against your long-term presidential candidate. And he didn't say that in the secret. He came out openly to say so. And all of them who are who have been uh, around the same team with President uh, Abubakar and uh, Sani and Secondus, uh, to mention, like I said, but said, supported that power should return to the North after eight years. And we can choose to support a southern president, President Bola Metinibu, and work as seriously as the only governor from the south, south here and beyond, that won the presidential election in APC for President Bola Metinibu. And the recognition President Bola Metinibu had accorded him, in view of his own impute, is what is their pain. They cannot withstand it. They don't understand. But they have also forgotten 
that as minister of the FCT, Wike, he has an outstanding performance. He has spectacularly changed the narrative in the FCT. So these are some of their, their problems. They cannot sit down to imagine someone they, quote and unquote, did say it was irrelevant. Someone they said, quote and unquote, has nothing to offer to Nigerians. But Mr. today, Kenda. it is clear that Wike is doing clearly to support the President Bolame Tinibus and APC's renewed hope agenda. Yeah. But that Mr. is that. Ike, Mr. Not, Mr. Ikenga, yes. is that, okay, so, yeah, oh, uh, thank you so much. But let's uh, circle back a bit, back to the crisis within the PDP and also in River State. If he's working at a national level because of zono, uh, zoning for, president, for presidency of the country, there are still things that he's doing within the party and within the state. And so I have to ask you, all of the statements that he has made against Fubara, who is your governor of your state and is supposed to be supported, but has made incitatory comments and also said he will set fire to states of PDP governors who support Fubara. Are you saying that you support his move and you support him and all of the statements that he's made? Okay, I don't know what statement you say he made against Fubara in this instance. He didn't make any statement. Allow me to finish. He did not make any statement against Fubara. Neither did he mention the name of Fubara. He spoke to the governors of PDP and one that structure is all about politics and that he has taken his time over the years to entrench his structure, which also produced Governor Sim Fubara. Forget about the disagreement that has come today and some of these um, persons mentioned have gone to align with the governor, encouraging him to rebel against his benefactor. And then if some PDP governors today have said they want to take his structure and give it to anyone else, you expect him to fold his hands? Taking his structure from him and giving it to someone else in his state is tantamount to creating political crisis in the state, and particularly in his party. And it was on the basis of that, he did say that same thing you want to do in my state. If you try it, I am also going to replicate them in your state. Fair and square. How what exactly do does he mean he's going to replicate to it? What exactly did he mean by he would replicate this uh, same instance in their states? What was he they talking said, about? Is this a physical they thing? Is this a we're going to political move? Take his structures and give it to someone else, maybe the governor of the state. Let me be more specific. And then by doing so, they are trying to create crisis in his party within River State. And mm -hmm. that he has this, he has his structure, he has the capacity, and you know that as well, to also create such disagreements within PDP in their own states. And when such things continue to happen, they'll be distracted as governors from good governance and focus on certain right, political crisis within PDP. All right, Mr. Kenga. Mr. Omar, you've heard plenty that Mr. Kenga has said. He's implicated some of the names that you have mentioned. I'm wondering if you have uh, a response to everything he's just said now. Ordinarily, I'm not supposed to respond to Mr. Ikenga because he is not a member of the PDP and he doesn't even understand the constitution of our party. He, he, he appears to be pontificating over the issues. First, uh, he quoted the constitution of the PDP as saying that power must rotate from the north to the south. And if I can remember, the last president of Nigeria with a, within the confines of the PDP, which is which is within this the, the realm of the constitution of the PDP, is Ullok Jonathan, who is from the south. So within the PT, PDP, the next available president should come from the north. So that is not, not an issue. And it could not have been an issue. If not because Wiki contested under the platform of the party and lost. And because he lost, at the, at the convention ground, Wiki had already, during his uh, speech, participatory, participatory speech, he said anybody who comes out from here is going to support him. But because of his uh, uh, personal and uh, pecuniary interest, he decided to renege on that and use some some political uh, subterfuge to to make some you know incendiary claims that uh, uh, that the power must return to the south, chairman must be removed. All those things were political gimmicks intended to frustrate uh, the party from moving further. So it is a case of if I cannot get it, nobody else can. And that was what he, he used 
yeah, in that respect. And more so, uh, no, nobody is against Wiki, but we are against his actions. This is his actions are undermining the, the our party, and because he is now partly a member of the APC and partly a member of the PDP, as he claims, you know, he the naturally I expect that Ikenga should be excited that uh, some you know a member of the PDP is now supporting their government, and so because he is supporting their government, he has to come out strongly to support. Mr. Again, if he if he, if if he assisted Fubara, if he assisted Fubara to become governor, does it mean that he has to lord it over him? Wouldn't he allow him to run the, the affairs of the state? I'm so glad you asked that question because then it, it begs to ask the question: How did Wike <coughs> amass such political power within the party? So much so that he's been able to do the things that he's done, make incitatory comments. Called name calling at you know executives of the party, and has said consecutively, repeatedly, without fail, that he will still work against the party in 2027. How has he amassed so much political power that the party itself, up until now, the leadership has been somewhat dilly dallying and not taking a stand? It, well, it is not about amassing. Uh, in 2023, and um, prior to the elections. The governors put their heads together. I, like I said, one of the greatest pleasure group within the party is the governors forum within the party. And Wike was a major factor within the governors forum at that time. And so he was able to, to bring them together to say, okay, this time around, a governor must be president and a governor must be vice president. And the governors bought his idea because, of course, they are the greatest pressure group. And so when they now decided on this, they now decided to take over the structures of the party, all of them. It was not a wicked that took over the structure. It was a general consensus. Autumn brought Ayucha Ayu as the chairman. Uh, uh, Bala Mohammed brought Damagun. You know, Tambuwal brought uh, Bature. And Arapaja was brought by by uh, and even the public well, was brought by the governor of uh, uh, Ohio State. So it's a combination of people who were mm -hmm. also with him. They were governors. Now these the same people who had worked with him to do all these things have now come out to say no. We have done that with you. Now we are now going back to the natural thing, and the natural thing is we will allow your governor all right. to also be in charge of the state. Mr. Marsani, thank you very much. Mr. Kenga, real quickly, just wanted to ask before we go, we're out of time, but will the APC take advantage of the PDP crisis currently going on inside of the state? What is their next move? Real quick, sir, if you don't mind. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sani um, has made um, utterances justifying why the presidency ought to have been turned to the north. The PDP constitution is not superior to the constitution of Federal Republic of Nigeria where in power rotation was expressly put in place. So for him to justify the fact that after President Mohamed Buhari, that it was supposed to be president, uh, uh, Vice President Atiku Abubakar, is most unfortunate. That power grabbing mentality will not happen in Nigeria. There is rotational presidency and we insist on it. And it was in the basis of that, Wike did all that he did. And yeah, I it's, it's very that. interesting and that... It's very interesting that APC is saying you, you will make the statement of power grabbing. Well, we've seen uh, how, uh, you know, very top officials have made bigoted statements and, you know, made such statements, especially during the running of the elections, with a, with a slogan like a milokon, which literally means it's my turn. No, no, no. Hold on. Hold on. Let, let, me, let me ask you. you. You, the anchor, who are anchoring this program, you have said, you particularly the lady, you have particularly said, we came making inciting statements. You have repeated it like three times. What inciting statements did he make? If I've you given say you say... As to it, why it can, Mr. Ikenga, if I say I will set fire to certain states if they do not stay out of the business in, 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 in my state, what does that mean? What it means is that I'm going to create a political crisis in your party if you do create in my own party. And, 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 and so that is what? What does it mean? Well, no, no, I'm asking you, if you, if you make such a statement, what does it mean? What, what does, well, how Who would you call it? Who fired the first salvo? 
So, on APC in River State, I want to tell you clearly that we are on the march to taking over the reins of governance in River State and we will retain the presidency at the national level. Sani, my friend, is unhappy that his party member and strong man, Chief Jason Wicke, is helping APC. He did, he did help APC to win presidency in River State. Mr. Kenga, we're he very also curious did help about one PDP thing. to win the <laughs> National Assembly members. I Mr. understand Kenga. how pain he is. He wants uh, Chief Wicke back. <laughs> We Mr. Are Kenga, for Chief we're, we're very curious about support. one thing, Mr. That Kenga. If you would please let me ask, Mr. Kenga, in all of this, with the heads here fighting, whether PDP or APC, regarding the people of whom this is most consequential, where do they stand in this imbroglio between the parties that are responsible? Is anybody considering them, the people who they're supposed to be serving? What do you have to say to that? You need to ask me that question that the people... Is the reason the time because we have nobody has said anything about the people it's always been talk about the leadership and the fight between zoning the, and the zoning and all of that but what about the people of river state if you allow me to speak i'm telling you that the reason for government to be instituted in the first place the reason data of government is to provide security and welfare of the people and that is what should be most paramount leadership must aim to ensure that provision of social services are made for the people, security and all that. And finally, let me say something. This discussion here is not about internal workings of PDP. These are about statements made by Chief Edwin Clark against our illustrious son, Chief Nyeso Wike, and then we condemn in its entirety the statements from Chief Edwin Clark. All right. Noted. Noted, Sumo. Thank you. Many, many thanks uh, to our guests today, Mr. Chibike Ikenga, and also to Mr. Umar Sani. I want to say thank you so much, gentlemen, for taking out your time in this Sunday morning to join us on this conversation. Many thanks again. Now, stay thank tuned, you. You because coming up, we have a very interesting conversation regarding health that everybody should take seriously. Stay tuned. We'll be back. Welcome. It's time for our big report from last week. Now, as Nigerians continue to grapple with the rising cost of living, there's one area hitting harder than, well, most health care. Um, and that's with drug prices soaring and access to proper medication becoming more challenging by the day. We're seeing a growing health crisis that threatens the well-being of millions, whether it's life-saving medication or routine treatments. Many Nigerians are now being forced to make impossible choices between their health and their wallet. And today we'll be diving into this issue. So, early last week, we had a special report from our News, News Central's uh, correspondent, Lekon Onobanjo, who had been on the ground co covering and gathering insights into the crisis. Let's take a look at his uh, findings. We will try to bring you that report during the course of our discussion today. But the cost of medicine is not just an economic issue, but a matter of life and death for many Nigerians. And, you know, the question now is, where do we go from here? How do we ensure that medication is affordable, accessible, and available to those who need it the most? So, and so to help us dissect these pressing issues, we're joined by Leko Onobanjo, our New Central's correspondent, who has put together the report we're going to show you in, uh, in, in due course, and also Dr. Owen Omojo. She's a public health practitioner, and they both join us to the show. Welcome, lady and gentlemen. Welcome. <laughs> nice to be here. Michael, let, let me start with you and, and say, based on your experience, you know, gathering this report, uh, what was the most shocking discovery for you? I recently had a health scare. I was kind of in the hospital. And when my bill came back... <laughs> it was your salary. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Listen, palpitations. I said, I'm not still feeling fine, though. please. Mm. <laughs> because I felt the, the symptoms again, but again... Uh, it, it, it was unbelievable to see that price. And the bulk of it was just the medicines. And I, I didn't even... Anyway. But How I, about here? Yeah, let's see that package. And we're going to see the package. Yes, we've been informed. I so, uh, you know the package is here. So let's take a look at the package yeah. and then we'll come back to that question. The escalating cost of prescription drugs in Nigeria has become a pressing concern. This is largely due to the depreciation of the Naira and Forex inaccessibility, amongst others, as importers have to pay more to secure medical items and equipment. Our major challenge is access to Forex. I, we don't care whether it's going to be 1,900 to the dollar or 3,100 
33,000 to the dollar. What we want is availability of forest so that we can address some of the issues burden on sourcing of manufacturing input, especially raw materials, excipients, and even machineries. Some of the imported uh, ingredients or drugs are cheaper than the one produced locally. And that's us to tell you about the cost of production. And why is that? What is called active pharmaceutical ingredients are also imported, largely from India, China, and Europe, Germany specifically. Despite government efforts to alleviate the burden through measures such as removing taxes on drugs, the prices remain unaffordable for many Nigerians. These increased costs are often passed on to the consumers, resulting in higher prices at pharmacies and healthcare facilities. We are living uh, in an environment that is full of things that make us sick. And uh, the only way to get well is taking treatment with drugs. So we just, it just has to be affordable. Drugs are just have to be affordable. And there's no responsible government that we do otherwise than to look into what will make drugs accessible and, of course, affordable. To effectively tackle the problem, a comprehensive approach is needed. If government can make forex available and government can be sincere with its own policy, I think this industry will be a lot better. Again, government will say we want to patronize Nigeria, we want to patronize made in Nigerian products. The same government officials would rather go and be buying made in China, made in India, which are even of lesser quality. The Nigerian government can work towards strengthening the local pharmaceutical industry, improve the drug supply chain, negotiate better deals with foreign suppliers, and implement price controls to make essential medications more affordable for its citizens. In Lagos for News Central, Lekon Onobanjo. And that report there is from Leko Onovanjo, who is here with us in the studio, as well as Dr. Owen Omoju. We'll be talking about the rising cost of uh, drugs and also the cost of healthcare and what it would mean to have access and the availability of it. But first, we need to go on a short break to bring you uh, the, headline, uh, the headlines, the breakfast headlines. And Mazzino is on standby. Don't go anywhere. Stay here. We'll be back. Welcome back. Unfortunately, we won't be bringing you the news, but continuing with our conversation regarding the rising cost of medicines and health care in Nigeria. As many people should be concerned, including us here inside of the studio, I've only just learned that one of us here has just mentioned how many numbers of mouths he has to feed and also take care of when it comes to their health. Lekha, you're welcome again. <laughs> what a shock it was, but then again, you are a sample of most Nigerians who have to take care of not just themselves, but their families and with the rising cost of medicines, especially if you're like I and Judith who have aging parents that you must take care of. I mean, Try. You've experienced what's going on. Try. The... And, and both of them have underlining issues, which exactly. is just not that makes it fun. very... Hmm. And the price of drugs that's between... I, I, it's Last okay. year around this time and this time. A tell me thing. why inhalers... Okay, I'm going to stop now. It's, personal, it's very personal. <laughs> but tell us, you, she asked from earlier um, mm. what you uh, discovered while you were gathering this report. Uh, okay, so um, most, let me start from here. Nigerians sleep and wake every day hoping not to fall sick. Yeah. Because the moment you're sick, the next thing that comes to your mind is not even how to get healed. It is how much do I pay to get it? Because number one, you're going to the hospital to see the doctor, you're paying. You're getting prescription drugs, you're paying. You're going to be getting syringe, you're paying. You're going to be having, you're going to be admitted, you know, you're paying. You're paying for everything. If you decide to go to the pharmacy, you're paying. So some people will now feel like, okay, what do I do? Do I go to the pharmacy? Do I go to the hospital? Or should I just self-medicate or even go to, um, you know, vendors, uh, 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 herbal vendors? to just get something I can just take and make me feel fine. So that is where, you know, Nigerians are now. It's a dilemma. Do I live? Do I die? How much do I spend? Then you're thinking about yourself and you're thinking about your families too. 
you are, you are literally praying every day that I don't want any member of my family to fall sick because the bill comes to your head and nobody plans to be sick. Mm -hmm. It's unprecedented. And that is, the, you know, that is the most important part of life right now for Nigerians. Mm -hmm. Now, let me now come to the other part. For um, drug manufacturers <coughs> and for hospitals, you know, that usually um, import equipments for medical treatments, they are actually going through pain right now because they have to pay so much to, act, to import you know, materials, raw materials to produce drugs or medical equipment to treat people. And they know that you know, by the time you import all these materials, you are paying import duties, you are paying taxes, you are paying the cost of transportation, you are, you are, the cost of pro production itself you know, has gone you know, over the roof. So by the time you put all that together and you put that bill on the consumer, will they be able, will they be able to pay so that is the pain. So um, medical practitioners are trying to stay afloat. They are trying to stay in business and still provide health. And they are equally scared. How do I stay in business when I have to put all the cost of these things mm -hmm. on my business in provision of health, knowing fully well that people might not be able to afford the payments? Mm -hmm. So it's a big issue now for everyone on the part of those who are providing health, mm -hmm. on the part of the consumers that are equally receiving health. And everybody is wondering, how do, we, how do we survive? How did we survive? How did we, how so do you we put it in a very mortal way when you say, do I live or do I die? That's very but you know, mortal. You know that we're one sickness away from poverty. I, I, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> wow, that's it. You make you depressing me now. Mm. Um, but it's true. Like, it's, it's, one, it's, it's one sickness away for you to start crowdfunding yeah. and having a GoFundMe on yes. Twitter and having your friends and family send links to people to mm. crowdfund for you to get better. It's just one thing that can bring us down to poverty. And so, I mean, I've just painted a dire critical situation, but Dr. Owen, you're right in it. You're right in the storm. You're seeing it. When it comes to access to affordable medicine, what is it? What exactly are the issues? Why are we seeing this? So um, earlier you mentioned, by the way, Lekon, that was a fantastic piece that you put <laughs> Thank together. You. Thank you. Well done on that. Um, so you mentioned three critical things, so accessibility, affordability, availability. But I also want to add quality mm. as well, right, to that list. Um, so what are the issues? These are the four cardinal things that we should be looking at. Um, when you talk about quality, of course, that's where we talk about NAFDAQ. So um, yes, we... We import 70% um, of the medications that we consume here are imported. And even for the ones that we manufacture locally, 50% of the raw materials are imported, right? Um, so quality on the aspect of quality, NAVDAC, I think they're, they're doing a good job with that. Um, I know that there's still a lot to be done um, with regards to locally manufactured products and ensuring you know that they have the right licenses and things like that um, so that's the issue with quality then affordability um, so we had JSK we had Sanofi leave we Nigeria. Had. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so we had them leave Nigeria recently right and those are some of the major manufacturers and distributors of essential medications in Nigeria and when you have that situation obviously prices are going to go up because now they are going they're, they've shifted to a third-party distribution model, which obviously makes, makes it, you know, harder. Why did they leave? What are the issues? Um, poor, I, I, say, I say if you want to do business in Nigeria, you have to, I mean, you have to have like nine lives, right? You have to turn into a cat um, because, I mean, you, you will fall more times than you would probably be able to get up. Right, so we have a very harsh business environment here, and so they were ma making losses and they had to leave. So that has driven up the cost. Of course, FX, um, like I said, most of the medications are imported, and even the ones that are manufactured here, over 50% of the raw materials are imported. So you need access to FX. Now you have, um, you know, um, the dollar rate than doing the yo-yo and, you know, dancing galala up and down. <laughs> you know, so that, that's a major issue. Um, of course, you talked about taxes in your piece, Lacon. Um, that's also another issue, multiple taxation, you know, custom duties and things like that. And I think what the government has done, 
um, recently there was an executive order to um, um, cut out um, import, duties, import duties, import duties, and um, to take out VAT on um, essential um, raw materials for to boost local production, right? Um, so that, that in itself is a good policy, but in terms of the implementation, so this is supposed to run for two years, mm -hmm. right? In terms of implementation, you still have people who, I mean, the, the time that it takes to import these things, you know, you have things on the sea. Is it the two year period, is it actually gonna be sufficient? And if it's not properly implemented, then, you know, that in itself could fail. Um, then in terms of accessibility, um, that's a major concern because you'd be surprised that the people who live in the rural areas, who are the most vulnerable, right? They pay more for these <coughs> medications because in terms of supply chain, getting it to the rural it's communities harder. is harder. So you find that the uh, more privileged in society actually buy these medications cheaper. And so they, they, we need to have, we need to be innovative in our supply chain management to ensure that what's getting to the people, you know, they're not having to pay an arm and a leg for it, um, improve supply chain through PPP. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you... Private partnerships. Yeah. But Dr. Owen, as a practitioner yourself, uh, noting that Nigerians have alternatives for anything. Hmm. If you ask us, D, I used to drive a car, I'll drive a bike now. <laughs> you know, we have solutions, alternatives. What alternatives yeah. do consumers have or, or people who are in this? Nigerians generally have when it comes to healthcare. If I can't afford these medicines, have you seen in any uh, situation where perhaps herbal alternatives are advisable? Would you advise that that should be a thing that Nigerians carry on with now, even, even in terms of academics research, yeah. making it a bigger... Uh, um... So in this case, one of, again, one of the negative effects is poor seeking health habits. So people um, now tend to, you know, um, resort to... Um, Holy Spirit no. for healing, for divine <laughs> healing, right? So that's what, that's what we get to see. Um, you see people skipping their medications, right? Just to make it last longer, right? And then we go to alternative medications. Alternative me medications, herbal medicine, in itself is not a bad thing, right? It's not a bad thing. <coughs> the problem is that we have not invested enough in research to know, um, you know, the, the type of herbs, um, the composition, the dosages, you know, um, safety, efficacy, things like that. So we've not invested so much in research. I mean, Chinese herbal alternative medicines work fantastically, and that's because they have invested largely in research. Is this the time then? Should Nigeria Absolutely. begin to do that? Absolutely. This is the time we, I mean, there, there isn't a better time. So we need more budgetary allocations and we need political will. We need people who actually um, have the vision and foresight to understand that we need to get out of this hole. We cannot continue. Mm. Nigeria is, it, it, we're too import dependent and we're so blessed. And it's, it's funny, right? I mean, growing up, we used to, um, shout out to Dr. E and my mom, <laughs> you know, she, she's a nurse, but... Um, she used to give us herbal, you know, medications, and which worked, you know. I mean, those things actually work. But then again, you need research because you need to know what's the dosage, you know. The severity, so you don't how overdose. Yes, dosage, exactly. And then the what rights. do you mix together? Mm -hmm. What concoction? Do you understand? So we can't continue with this hit or miss approach to herbal medications. Let me, you know, let me come yeah. to you, Lekon, and ask. I remember when uh, Doctor here was talking about the the import duty and VAT removal for essential ingredients or products for the for, to boost local manufacturing. You were shaking your head, right? <laughs> when I was watching you, you were shaking your head to that part. So I wanted to get your reaction. Um, when it comes to a lasting solution in terms of this problem, do you think PPP and the reversal on import duty and VAT can, or removal is the right solution? Okay, so uh, let me start with um, the issue around um, the VAT and the import duties being removed. Fantastic, like you know, she said, it's good. But then when you look at um, the possibility, the implementation, and what impact it would have overboard or over time, you discover that it is minimal. All right. So when I spoke with um, some of the farm calls, the, uh, um, the pharmacists, mm -hmm. those who manufacture drugs, they said it is nice 
but it's more or less like a drop in the ocean. Why? Because she mentioned it. Forex is the issue. If I'm going to be importing and um, the dollar rate is now 1,600 compared to six months ago, compared to a year ago, you discover that, you know, that, that lacuna, filling that gap financially is a huge burden on the manufacturers. So that is the issue. So they are saying that, okay, if there is going to be um, a need for us to upscale our operations and to stay in business, and you cannot remove fuel subsidy because it's part of the issue, mm -hmm. let's ensure that Forex is stable. And let's ensure that the dollar is available mm -hmm. so that when we're able to access Forex and the Naira to the dollar parity you know, is pegged and it is stable, then we know how much we need to spend. So if it is just 2,000, if it's 3,000 to a dollar, we know that this is the amount and that sustainability will help them project and plan. So, and so say, okay, this is the amount I need to spend mm -hmm. to import. So the farm calls are still looking up to the government for solutions. Basically. Uh, okay. But this is the same government with people in it who have access to well, jets that they can fly outside of the country. <laughs> okay, I'm going to walk and, and, and go get medical, uh, medical tourism. Uh, is the, the, thing. The, that, that's that's so, normal. It, it depends on priority of government. Doctor, I, I don't know. Is the government the right people to turn to? I mean, you already suggested uh, research into herbal uh, um, medicines and all alternatives. But, alternatives, thank you very much. But is the government really going to help in this um, case, or should we just find our own square the, root? The truth is, um, of course, there are multiple stakeholders. So the government, um, financial institutions, um, international organizations, and donor bodies, um, you know, these are all uh, multiple stakeholders. So. We need to be creating, so yes, we need FX, right? But another problem, and just being an entrepreneur and you know, being in the field of um, distributing and selling medical equipment, consumables and medications as well, because that's part of what my co company does. Um, I know that one of the major challenges is access to capital, access to funding. You know, so we need to encourage the people who are currently in, playing in that space and um, other new players coming in. And that's why the financial institutions come in. Um, you know, the, the, the rates, the, the interest rates when you're getting funding for or lending from, um, the, from the commercial banks, mm -hmm. it's crazy. The interest rates are crazy. And so where government can come in here is to say, so we have bank of industry, right? It shouldn't cost an arm and a leg for you to get funding and support from the bank of industry, right? Um, corruption is a major challenge, right? So when you're going to the government and government institutions that provide lending to manufacturers and things like that, there's a lot of corruption in that system. I mean, we would probably need an entire week to discuss that. Yeah, we could come next right? Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and then of course, I talked about international um, donor organizations, so um, grants, um, grants, single-digit um, single, single digit interest loans, you know, things like that. Those are things that could um, encourage local manufacturing because I think we need to start moving from our de over-dependency on um, imports, imports to encouraging local manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, um, there are other things um, that we can do apart from the local manufacturing as well. Um, I think that government can subsidize. So now with the subsidy is gone, but subsidy don't come back, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, but I'd say like, why, why don't we subsidize things like essential uh, medications? Because you go to our, uh, our public hospitals and they are out of you know, <coughs> medications, right? So um, why don't we subsidize essential medications in public institutions, um, public hospitals, strengthen primary health care, you know, um, right. so that people can have access right. to, you know, these essential medications. And of course, CSR, ISR, so individual, individual social responsibility, corporate social responsibility programs, mm -hmm. sort of like what my distinguished senator is doing, Senator Neda in Maswen. I've started, <laughs> it's okay, yeah, you cannot campaign here. Eh? No, no, I'm not, I'm not campaigning, I'm, I'm not joking, campaigning. I'm joking, I'm joking. Back to regular programming, uh, Malika. <laughs> Malika, because uh, we're pressed with time. Okay. Um, CSOs, collaboration, mm -hmm. government individuals, international bodies, uh, is there more that we can do um, to, to, to bring a lasting solution. 
So, um, remarks. so yes, uh, there's a lot we can do. And one thing is to ensure that the environment, you know, is conducive for is all doing parties, mm. for everyone. So even, even if you are going to be having, um, you know, people come up, provide loans, grants and all that, they will look at the environment. If monies are coming in, where are they going to? If investors want to also put their money into, you know, that sector of the economy, they are wondering, will they be able to recoup? Mm -hmm. That instability itself, you know, would pull them back. And if, like, like we said, or like I said, if the environment is not conducive enough, if there are no level playing fields, when everyone can come to the party and collaborate to get the job done, then we are just, you know, talking. You cannot we're, be talking we're, from we're both just, sides of your yeah, mouth. Yeah, we are just talking. So Let those are, yes, those are yes, the things. You know, you know. So, so, so when it comes to health, like she said, it's all about finance, collaboration. But then, you know, it's all about the government making it possible for those things to happen. To and that is because, like I said, it's not everybody that has access to, uh, that has access to um, insurance, mm. uh, health insurance. That's another Some thing. people well, have to Why pay. did you mention that word now? We're I running, just, I we're just, running uh, up. I just need to bring it up. Like, you work here, has, you know how these things work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's run so on the that's second. just it. But yeah. that's a topic, mm. Doctor, that we must touch on the next time Absolutely. that you come. Yes. We were talking about it, health insurance, access to health insurance, and how that can help you know, um, reduce out-of-pocket spending for purchasing of medications. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess we'll find time to talk about this. As we're talking about more. that, that's um, HMO, mm -hmm. uh, which is health insurance. Health I think insurance. we should also talk about, you know, how it's accessible to people with underlining Absolutely. issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That yeah. is such a big problem Absolutely. because really those are the ones that need mm -hmm. Yeah. HMO, they yeah. need it. They yes. really do. Yes. Well, um, we wish we could exhaust it currently, <laughs> but we cannot. But then we will be inviting the doctor back again. And maybe Lakeham might put together another report regarding insurance. <laughs> and we'll be glad to have it here on Breakfast Extra. Do stay tuned because coming up, we're going to be taking another big story. We talked about the PDP crisis. Well, let's talk about the LPs one up next. And in the latest development within the Labour Party, a leadership crisis has intensified as a faction led by Julio Saburi rejected the reconciliation panel headed by Limidu uh, Apapa's faction. The 29-man panel established by Apapa's side and led by Chairman Oti was designed to address internal disputes, but Saburi's faction has dismissed it as illegitimate. The conflict threatens to deepen the rift within the party, particularly as they prepare for the next round of elections. Now, the division stems from long-standing tensions over the leadership structure, mm -hmm. with both factions vying for control. Aburi's camp has consistently questioned the authority of a Papa's faction, and this latest rejection of reconciliation efforts highlights the deeper mistrust between the two sides. Many within the party, the Labour Party, worry that this power struggle could weaken the party's overall standing and derail its ability to function effectively in the coming months. And so joining us today, uh, Mr. Abayomi Arabambi. She's the Factional Publicity Secretary for the Labour Party and also will be joined by G Mr. Gambo Daniel Balarabi. He's the former Chairman of Contact and Stakeholders Engagement Committee of the Labour Party National transition uh, gentlemen he will join us shortly but mr Bayomi, thank you so much for coming and we appreciate you for doing this with us welcome mr Bayomi. Yeah, good morning uh, uh, thank you for having me thank you uh, let's start with uh, let's start with your thoughts so far what is the main reason your faction rejected uh this reconciliation panel and do you foresee any future where there's dialogue and reconciliation between both factions well, thank you very much. Uh, like I said, uh, there is a mix-up here in your introduction. A Papa fashion is not the, is not the one rejecting the purported meeting, where, as far as we are concerned, the people they are gathered to celebrate their entrance into political menopause. We are not part of it, and there is no fashion in the Labour Party. Our Papa and Aburi are one body now, and the other people are the illegal, unconstitutionally recognized, unconstitutional, uh, compo, compo, um, um, uh, I mean, unconstitutionally composed, uh, self-tied neck 
or whatever they call their names. So for the avoidance of doubt, uh, Papa and uh, Abure are one body after the judgment of the Court of Appeal. Even though we are still before the Supreme Court, but as a law abiding, you know, Nigerian, after we got the receiving order, the same people celebrating themselves now as leaders of the party went against the FCT High Court order that restrained Abure then in 2023, because I want people to really understand. After that, Abure proceeded to Court of Appeal with them, with the NFC, with Alessoti, with Peter Obi, with Gambo, all of them proceeded to Court of Appeal. And Abure won, and the Court of Appeal said that uh, that receiving order is hereby set aside until a superior court set that Court of Appeal other side and the judgment of the court of appeal is that Abure should continue. On that note, Abure called for a, a peaceful meeting, even while the court, I mean the Supreme Court, our matter is still pending before Supreme Court because that is the only court in the land that will settle. That's the only court that will settle issue of leadership. So we came together as one body with Abure and Papa, and that was why I reverted back to my position as Daniel Bobby Secretary. A papa divided by the future, a deputy national chairman, a bully retained his chairman, Faru retained his uh, position. And as we speak now, there is no vacancy in the National Great Committee. Now, having said that, because I know the other man will come and say, so let me quickly prepare some ground for us. Section 222 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, I repeat, Section 222, I am not the one that wrote it. No association by whatever name called shall function as a party, as a political party, unless the name and address of national officers are registered with the Independent National Electoral Commission. Two, every member of the association is open to every citizen of Nigeria, irrespective of its place of origin, circumstance of birth, sex, religion, and ethnic grouping. A copy of a constitution is registered in the principal office of the Independent National Electoral Commission. That is section 222A, B, C, you know, is it continue, but let me stop here. Now, regarding our constitution, in Osibo versus Sinek, the Supreme Court, Osibo versus Sinek, because you have lawyers there, the annex said political party must obey their constitution. If you don't obey your constitution and you now say you want to obey the constitution of Nigeria, the Supreme Court said you are only wasting your time and you will run peril of your constitution. Now, what Section 222 says is that anybody could register an association, but once you call it a political party, it will leave your domain and now reside where in A, they said addresses, officers shall be lodged with the Independent National Electoral Commission. That means I <clears throat> is the one in charge of local party and not the person that register it as you know a liability limited company when you register a company it's different but once you call it a political party you know it will leave you it will have a life of its own now our constitution in line with the supreme court article 11 please help me to write it down so that when you another person speak it was i need to quote from our constitution and not from constitution of pdp where they came from article 11 part organization there shall be Four level shall connote in the Supreme Court context as a must, please. There is no ambiguity here, and no lawyer will come and tell me that what shall mean is maybe you know something that they have an option. No, it is a must. Our constitution said there shall be four level of part organization, namely what local government, state, and national. Please, I am reading from the Fantastic. part of the constitution. So I nobody will now raise... think. Thank you, because I wanted you to raise the, 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 the constitution for us to take a look at. Continue, please. Okay, okay. So now, the Article 12, principal organs of the party. We, the principal, number one, the most senior is National Convention. The neck is the next. National okay, Committee, Board of Trustees. I don't want to belabor you with the rest. Now, let us now go to the power. I, I mean, I mean, the composition of neck now. Our National Executive Council shall consist of one national chairman, three deputy national chairmen, 
at least one of whom will be a female and other representative for the platform. The vice president, the president, president of the Senate, and deputy, speaker and deputy, if produced by the party, governors and deputy governor. Then they now list all other NWC you know, member. Now, the issue here is this, the purported celebration and exhibition of menopause, political menopause, in Abia has been defeated because we do, we do not have anything called stakeholder <clears throat> in any organ of our party, world, local government, state and national. Then the principal organs of the party is National Convention, Executive Council, Working Committee, Board of Trustees, State Congress, State Security Council, up to World Executive Council. So, right. ab initio, what they were doing is illegal. Now, okay. in 2009, <clears throat> let me remind Nigeria, Abdullah Idoma was the uh, president of NFC. Mimiko asked them, why can't you amend this year, Composition of National Assembly Council, to include the National Assembly member, the State Assembly member, and some other people? Their answer to him was that they will hijack the party. That was why, technically, Papa Jofo and Co wrote this constitution and excluded the National Assembly. Now, they put the governor because they never knew we are going to have governor until when Mimiko came on board. But Mimiko didn't interfere like uh, Governor Lesotho is doing. You know, he will call a peaceful meeting when by Sadanya was national chairman and A. Salah was the national secretary. Now, once you are not a member of the National Executive Council, how dare you now say, oh, I am calling for next and now set up one caretaker committee. Now, right. I will now go to the tenure of our officer. Just a moment, okay, sir. Just, just a moment, moment sir. Just a moment, sir. I know you're about to go to the tenure part of it to establish whether or not uh, Aburi's tenure is up and is no more uh, the, the, uh, the amount of affairs when it comes to leadership of Labour Party. But we've just been informed uh, that uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Daniel Gambo has joined as engineer. Uh, Daniel Gambo, he is the uh, former chairman of the Contact and Stakeholders Engagement Committee of the Labour Party National Transition, uh, and he joins us now. Uh, live. I understand, sir, that you're pressed for time and you will not be here for long, so we won't take too much of your time. Giving uh, Mr. Uh, Arabambi's response and reading from the Constitution, how do you respond now to the allegations or the accusations from the Abure's camp uh, that the panel that has just been formed, newly formed, is illegitimate? Thank you very much, uh, moderator. I didn't capture, I didn't get your name, though. I'm sorry about that. Um, I've listened, though, I'll be positioned here. However, yes, Arabi quoted the Constitution correctly. There's no ambiguity. But his definition of stakeholder is false. If you look at the definition of stakeholder, it's anyone who is financially and registered to be a member of an association or a union is a stakeholder. And if by the Asaba Convention, I'm not going to go into a lot of stories, granted Aburi a one-year extension to conduct an all-inclusive and expansive convention starting from, this one is the judgment of Justice Gabriel Kolawele from what congresses, local government congresses, and state congresses, and the, uh, accumulating into the national convention, with, with, with under, underline that word, with delegates elected at the world, at the local government, and at the state level to attend such a convention. This was not carried out by the convention that extended tenure from the agreed NEC meeting in Asaba on the 8th of April 2023 that granted him one year to conduct that, noting that 
at Justice Kola Ole's judgment, granting months to inaugurate a board of trustees. Abu um, Arab and B that is speaking there was a former uh, public relation officer of the party. He was expelled by the party. Expelled. When you say somebody is expelled, and today, when he was expelled, uh, um, Abure was the chief chairman, recognized the chairman of the party, and there was a disciplinary committee. And that committee expelled him for him to come back today and start talking on behalf of Abure. It's amazing and abhorring as a Nigerian who believes in uh, um, sincerity and the progress of the country and believe in due process. He shouldn't show his face here. In fact, when I saw him, I wanted to leave. But I said, well, it's good to stay to educate the people. Now, the stakeholder meeting convened in Abia. It's an OC political commission in April 8, um, 2024, during which all the stakeholders, including Abure and his colleagues, were invited. Yes, some of them attended. And in that meeting, understanding that his tenure will expire on the uh, 10th of June, passed also a vote of no confidence because he's shrouded in a lot of legal court cases of forgery, perjury, and all sorts of... Look, we are Nigerians and we want true, true country. We want actually a nation where our masses will now get the right and the, um, what they call, dividend of democracy. We don't want to truncate what our uh, leaders have said with respect to democracy. No, now, sir. the new critical committee is not here to inherit the position of the uh, leaders of the party is just a committee instituted by us, the stakeholders, to say, look, come in, set the stage right for congresses to take place at the world, local government, state, and national, for a national convention with elected delegates. And thereafter, officers, what are they afraid of? The Abure and Arabambi and their group, what are they afraid of? Go what? and contest at your word if you deserve to be a world representative or local government or state yes. or you know if you want if you think you have the capacity to contest any position at the national nobody is driving you away we want people to join the party but this party must be a party that nigerians want to use as platform to aspire into whatever political position they want to not transactional party but somebody defined it yesterday to me as top i chop party all right. right. The people is like Gambo, Abdul, Kar, Abdul Rahim, Abdul Ibrahim Wahab, and the others. We intend to put this party in the right platform of right position for everybody now, to come. Gambo, and I will defend. Can, we will defend hear. the right of everybody who wants to contest. There All will right. be no appointment. There will be no apportioning of position. Everybody will come and contest like every other person. Thank you very this much, Engineer Gambo. Thank and you I don't much. think Thank I have much time. I'm in church. Yeah, I yes. have to leave you people. All and right. I have said all. If you want more, I can be around again to talk to you. We Thank would you love that Gambo. much. We will definitely send you another invitation, but uh, thank you so much for thank taking out the much. time. We really did hope that uh, uh, Mr. Rabambi would uh, give you a right of reply there in some of the statements that you made, but mm -hmm. we'll do that in, in due course. Uh, Mr. Rabambi, uh, um, you've heard what Mr. Engineer Gambo has said regarding the leadership, and we can hear the differing, we can hear the differing uh, opinion regarding... The, uh, please, would you please unmute your... Phone. We are unable to get your audio, if you do not mind. Thank you very much, Mr. Rabambi. Now, after hearing what Engineer Gambo has said regarding the leadership of the LP, what is there to say about reconciliation? What would the party do to be able to get out of this tussle that they find themselves right now? What could be the best way out? Well, before I go to that, I hope I'm audible now. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yeah, you see, for me, I discuss based on constitution whether constitution Nigeria Electoral Act and the party constitution. I was about to discuss the function of national chairman and the tenure. Now, Article 14, so that you know we are talking to international television. Only God knows where and where they are watching us all over the world. Now, Article 14, said power and function of national officer. One, national chairman shall give leadership and shall preside over all meetings of the national convention National Executive Council, the National Committee. 
he stated, shall, shall, I said again. Now, the National Secretary, in Article 14, I mean 14, 4B, National Secretary shall cause to be issued notices of meeting of the National Convention, National Executive Council, and National Committee of the Party in consultation with an approval of the National Chairman. <clears throat> And finally, from our, our party constitution, Article 15, talk about tenure of national, I mean, of office. All national officers of the party shall hold office for a period of four years and shall be er eligible for re-election. But Article 15, 5, say that no member shall serve in the same office for more than eight years, except a person who first came to the office via vacancy. Via vacancy, anybody that comes via vacancy can even spend beyond <clears throat> eight years. You know why? That was what they eat away from just collaboratively. Now, in 2018, about the convey, I mean, about the purported <clears throat> court constant judgment, they were talking about Abure was not the national chairman, it was A. A. Salam, the late A. A. Salam. Abro, but Abro was not a secretary. He was not in the picture. It was A. A. Salam, the president of NSC, the president of TUC, that were indeed, we do know B or Governor OT, they are, all of them are still doing their business. Gambo are doing their business in PDP. As of 2018, now, what they now did, what the consent government said, they should organize an all-inclusive convention based on Labour Party constitution. It was just the economic ability too. Based on Labour Party Constitution, I am going to send it to you from my phone after this meeting. Now, in 2019, we now proceeded to Akwanga to organize our convention. There, NSC nominated Maria Labake and Umoru. <clears throat> DUC nominated Ladilia and one other person into that convention. And that was why. That woman succeeded our late chairman when he died. The, 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 our first Latin American chairman was Maria Labeke from the NSC. So Mr. that has already been taken care of. Mr. Rabami. Now, when the man died, Mr. in 2021, Rabami. we elected Aburi Mr. as Rabami. our national chairman. 2021, he was elected national chairman. That's what you just said for Aburi. Yes. Aburi now has now been president yes. for three years. Um, and now we're in 2024. And so I have to ask you, um, with all of the submission uh, that our last uh, 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 guest made, and that is uh, Engineer Gambo Daniel Balarabi, he said that an invitation was extended to yourself and other members of uh, the Aburi-led ex-schools. Ex and most of them, some came, some did not come. He also said that there was a vote of no confidence in the president, in, in the uh, the current national chairman or the chairman Aburi, it, well, he also said that um, uh, that uh, because of that no that vote of no confidence, uh, that everyone else they had to then install a new uh, committee, and that this national committee is as only stakeholders. This is not about the leadership, and nobody is trying to hijack the party. Hold on, I'm coming. Now, with all that he said, I'm giving you a right of reply. Are you going to reply to any of the, the allegations or statements that he made regarding your escorts of the Aburi led escorts or your team saying that, especially the fact that all of the members who attended voted, all the stakeholders there voted a no confident vote in the case of Aburi, Aburi as national chairman? See, you can't do something or nothing where you like the locals. The court said locals. Is a place of standing. Once you are not given a platform to stand, you dare not go there and tell them this is how this structure was supposed to be put in place. I said, the, when you want to convene a meeting, if the national secretary and national chairman that can convene <coughs> meeting of the national convention, national executive council, and national working committee, so you can see where we are coming from. <coughs> what they are doing, what they did there was just a jamboree. And like I said, they are just exhibiting the fact that they have reached their political menopause because they don't seem to understand. Now, the man is talking about vote of confidence. When you don't have a locus, who are you to have vote of no, no confidence? 
in all those meetings there, it is only Alessotti <clears throat> and his deputy that is a member of our National Executive Council. We don't have any other governor. Obi, as our former president candidate, does not have a place in our constitution. It wasn't us that did it. It was Papa Diopo that did it. With them, with themselves there, the NSP, because they were afraid that a politician will come and hijack their social. And you have seen what is happening. Now, they are talking about uh, the credibility. They said that Bure doesn't have credibility. The court, court of appeal said, we are wrong. We can't query the court. We have to go higher. But the woman they appointed has over 7.4 billion EFCC matter on her head. Over 7.4 billion EFCC arranger. She has been drug twice in Kirikiri prison. That matter is still ongoing. Do not forget, that was how they brought Dr. Yokupe. And at the end of the day, EFCC has to do their job. On this woman also, she is not credible because she was the financial director of the Northern Campaign Organization. She was also on loan to the Labour Party by PWP in 2023 general election. Where up to today, they have not been able to give us audited, financial audited account of our income and expenditure. And that was why EFCC even arrested her, where money was just transferred without any receipt. And she is still on need today. And for us, all of them, especially Governor and the we are holding a meeting shortly where all of them will be suspended. Mr. And Rabbi, we are we... also going to write to, yeah, all of them will be suspended by our neck. And we are also going to write to the SDC. They should come and look at the book of this woman now. We don't want people with cultural character to come and invade our party because as a team, for God's sake. I, people, you want to who are the people, people with questionable characters? I said, he was saying the poor vote on no confidence on Aburi. I said, Nene Jusman has no, has no competency, has no capacity, has no credibility. Because from Jonathan administration in 2016, he was sent to click the prison over a fraction of seven point something billion that she has not explained today. She is on a bill of 500 million as we speak. A bill of 500 million. And now that was the kind of character that would be brought to come and manage their own party, like they did with the Dr. Don Yokupe. All of you knew what happened. We, we spoke about that thing. They didn't listen Mr. to Mr. Rabami, we wish we could the let PSCC, you continue, you know? but unfortunately we have run out of time. We have to say thank you and yeah, put a pin in it for now. But thank you very much, sir, for all the explanations and also giving your stand on the opinion. We appreciate it very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to show a break when we come back on the other side. We have Favor Itwa on standby to bring us sports. His eye is waiting. Uh, Favor, first of all, can I just say exciting times? We have qualified for the Afghans, aren't we? Welcome to Sports Update on Breakfast Extra. I'm Favor Itwa. We'll begin with uh, stories from football where Super Eagles caretaker coach Augustin Aguavon believes the team. Can adapt to any style of play. In their recent 2025 Africa Cup of Nations qualifier, Eguavo employed a 3 4 3 formation against Benin Republic, leading to a decisive 3 0 victory at the Gosila Pabe International Stadium, Uyo. Ademola Lukman scored twice, and Victor Osime added a third goal as substitute. Eguavo praised the success of a, this tactical approach, and looking ahead, the Super Eagles will face the Amavubi of Rwanda in their next match on Tuesday. The game will take place at the Amahoro Stadium in Kigali. This upcoming encounter will, of course, test the ability to transition smoothly between different styles of play. Information is only information. And um, we have players with quality. You can decide to play in any system. This is something we discussed. And I also observed, I slept over it. And I know, you know, with the caliber of players that we have, we can decide to play any formation and be successful. Yeah, you know, the players are always there. And, um, <clears throat> you know, when much is expected from Nigerians, that's where we see performance. People have been, you know, been getting a lot of backlash, and then the boys didn't know it, and we know we have the caliber and quality to be able to beat anything. Away from the Super Eagles of Nigeria to the women's uh, under-20 team, Nigeria's under-20 women's team, the Falconet advance to the round of 16 at the 2024 FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup in Colombia with a 4-0 victory over Venezuela. Aminat Bello scored the opener in the 16th minute, followed by Chia Maka Okuchuku's goal in the 28th minute, and Flavio Sebastian's strike 
just before halftime. Joy Ibukwe added the final goal, securing two wins in three group stage matches. Nigeria had previously defeated Korea Republic 1-0 and lost 1-3 to Germany. This marks the ninth time the Falconets have reached the knockout stages. Now, despite Germany's group stage loss, they topped Group D on goal difference, while Nigeria also advanced with six points for the lower goal difference. Away from the Falconet, uh, let's now give you some updates uh, from other sports. Uh, Nigeria's charity, Jatau, clinched the gold medal in women's 50 kilogram at the World Beach Sambo Championships in Casablanca, marking the country's debut at the event. Jatau dominated her weight category, defeating compet competitors from <coughs> Morocco, Kazakhstan, and Romania. She expressed her gratitude to the Sambo Association of Nigeria for their support, particularly San President Lovett Howes and Vice President Sheriff Ahmed, who played a crucial role in her participation. The San aims to boost the sports profile in Nigeria and is working towards having Sambo included in the Olympic Games. Both Howes and Ahmed highlighted Nigeria's commitment to the sport and its potential future in the Olympics. And now to the world of tennis. World number two, Irina Sabalenka won the New York title with a 7-5, 7-5 victory over Jessica Pegula, adding the U.S. Open to her back-to-back -back Australian Open triumphs. Sabalenka, the first woman since Angelic Kerber in 2016 to win both hardcore majors in the same season, struck 40 winners and overcame early struggles, including a 0-3 deficit in her second set. Now, despite a strong comeback from Pegula, who rallied from 2-5 to 5-5, Sabalenka secured the win in a marathon 12th game of the second set. Congratulations to, of course, Sabalenka. All right, that wraps it up on Sports Update. I'm Favor Itwa. Morning and welcome. It's the headlines here for Breakfast Extra. Now let's begin with an update on fuel crisis. The Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited has denied claims that it is responsible for the recent hike in petroleum motor spirit, commonly known as petrol, in the country. The company said the pricing of petroleum products from any refinery, including the Dangote Refinery Limited, is determined by global market forces, started, uh, stating that there is no guarantee of lower price associated with domestic refining of the product in the country. The NNPC stated this on Saturday in reaction to rumors it is attempting to monopolize the offtake of all products from the Dangote refinery. The NNPC further emphasized that there is no guarantee of lower prices associated with domestic refining compared to any global parity pricing framework, as confirmed by the Dangote Refinery Limited. And a coalition of civil society organizations in River State is calling on the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, and the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission, ICPC, to investigate corruption allegations against Mohiba Dankaka, chairman of the Federal Character Commission. This comes amidst frustrations over the delay in the House of Representatives Committee's report on the issue, which remains outstanding over a year since the investigation began. During the committee hearings chaired by Yusuf uh, Gagdi, 14 witnesses testified that they paid money to Haruna Kolo, a former IPPIS desk officer at the F EFCC, in exchange for job placements. Kolo admitted to collecting money from job seekers and claims to have passed the funds on to Dankaka. Efena Georgewell, chairman of the River State Council, a civil society organization, criticized the House of Representatives for its inaction and urged anti-graft agencies to prove their effectiveness beyond tackling minor cybercrimes. And in more news, a senior official at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has confirmed that the United States is seeking consular access to Tigran Gambarian, a detained Binance executive currently held at the Kujie Custodial Center in Abuja. Gambarian, a U.S. citizen and Binance uh, Financial Crimes uh, Compliance uh, Chief with, uh, arrest, who was arrested in February 2024 alongside another executive, Anjuwala, upon their arrival in Nigeria. Their detention is linked to an ongoing investigation that allegedly connects Binance to money laundering and terrorism financing. Justice Emeka Nwite of the Federal High Court in Abuja has set October 9 as the date to rule on a fresh bail application submitted by Gambarian's legal team. Concerns about Gambarian's health have been raised with Binance CEO Richard Tank urging for his release due to claims of inadequate medical care. 
Now, let's go on a quick break because that's all we have for the headlines. But do stay tuned as we bring you an extra special report here on Breakfast Extra. Do stay tuned. And it's time for our extra special for Sunday. In a disturbing incident, Nigerian police arrested suspected serial killer Ibrahim Ajayi on September 5th, 2024, following a string of murders involving students from Ogun State University. The latest victim, a 22-year-old student, was found dead under suspicious circumstances, igniting public outrage. Ajayi had reportedly been on the run after committing several brutal killings that targeted young women creating widespread fear on campus and within the community. Now, however, the arrest raised critical questions about the rising levels of violent crimes and also moral decay among Nigerian youth. Cases like this point to a deeper societal issue where lawlessness, criminal behavior, and even heinous acts like serial killings are becoming alarmingly frequent. The growing trend highlights underlying issues of social disintegration, a failing education system, and deteriorating family structures, all contributing to the moral decline. Now, joining us to discuss this today are Dr. Bonjubola Abiri, a consultant psychiatrist and associate lecturer, and also Dr. David Falarami, a life coach and psychiatrist. Thank you for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. You're welcome. Thank you for coming on. I mean, when we look at the news, it's very, very sad indeed to see just the, the amount of uh, crime against women and just murder of young girls, and which is all perpetrated by young boys. And so, Dr. Abiri, uh, I have to ask, how does, you know, upbringing, you know, and family and, struct and structure influence uh, the rising crime rates that we've seen, especially with young boys? Well, so thank you for the question and thank you for taking it back home. Thank yeah. you for taking it back to the family, which is pretty much the foundation. Uh, there's a good book that says that if the foundation is faulty, what can the righteous do? And so everything starts and falls at the level of the family. What we found these days, and I like that, you know, while the focus is on, you know, crimes against women, the truth is there's a rise in crime globally. It's not just, you know, against women. It's against children. It's against men. Mm -hmm. It's against, you know, people who are vulnerable and who people feel like they can take advantage of. But, you know, in particular situations with women, especially like the case you just um, highlighted, like, you know, the one that was on the news about the Ugandan, you know, athlete yeah, who was, you know, killed brutally. What we find is that a lot of the behavior, especially that tends towards aggression, is learned. And so it goes back home. It goes back to, you know, psychological development, psychological theories. Where did we grow up? What kind of environments did we grow up in? Were they, you know, comfortable, loving environments or were they environments where people were exposed to adverse childhood experiences? So research will show you that when you look at criminals, and it's also very important that, you know, people don't dismiss that every criminal has a mental illness. No. It's easily, you know, explained away when you want to say that, oh, every criminal has a mental illness. Mental illness is not the only reason why people commit crimes. People can be impulsive. People could have learned crime over time. And so generally speaking, what you find is that children model behavior that they see around them. And so research would show you that quite a number of people who go into crime are people who grew up in environments or, you know, families where dysfunctional families where either one parent was a criminal or one parent was exposed to heavy substance abuse, environments that are, you know, very, um, um, what I call it now, very, you know, places like slums, mm -hmm. places where, you know, there's a lot of crime. They see crime, they view crime. Crime is a part of their, you know, day in, day out activities. And unfortunately, in societies where crime is also not, you know, it's not punished, it's not punished appropriately. And so beyond the home where children would have learned crime, where they would have been able to tolerate crime, not see violence as a big deal, because it's something that they have, you know, been attuned to every day of their lives, is also the fact that the society also plays a very, very huge role. If the society, you know, are declining moral levels, are declining values, where, you know, for instance, you know, this morning I was, I was reading up something and I saw that, you know, even Yahoo Boys Association, their mothers have an association, association of Yahoo, Yahoo Boys. Boys. Mothers yes, association. Yahoo Boys Mothers Association. So the decline is in depth. The decline is it's totally bad. But definitely everything goes back mm, to the home to where there's a lot of learning, where there's a lot of influence on, on, mm. on unavailable structures such as the family structure. Yeah, mm. uh, it's very interesting that you should actually make that a pivotal point of this conversation here, the family and... Um, substance abuse, you also mentioned that. I want to come to Dr. Falarami here. Um, if you can hear me, um, 
Yes, you can. So regarding the mention of substance abuse here, you've had plenty of experience life coaching and also uh, dealing with young people. Do you find that this is a rampant occurrence inside of society when it comes to people who are prone to crime or perhaps have committed crime? Is substance abuse a major factor? Dr. Falaramik, please go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, I would say... Um, Substance abuse plays a major role. It's a major factor in, uh, in uh, the rise in crime rates that we see, uh, just not just across the country, but um, uh, in the continent and all over the world. Uh, Dr. Abiri mentioned uh, the, the Ugandan athlete that was uh, brutally murdered. Well, there's no, there's no pointing to the fact that uh, the perpetrator might have been on substances, but then we've had similar instances because I deal with people who struggle with substance abuse every day, and I have to work closely with uh, law enforcement agencies and legal practitioners uh, in cases where some of these crimes were perpetrated as a result of uh, being under the influence of substances. So we've seen this happen time and time and time again. We've seen uh, cases of um, sexual assault. We've seen cases of uh, uh, violence, you know, widespread violence that was uh, induced by substance use in many cases, especially among young persons, you know. So, yes, substance use does play a major factor. Remember, when a person is under the influence of these substances, he or she uh, most probably probably wouldn't know what they are doing at the time that crime is committed. So um, we've seen it a lot, that substance use plays a major role in fueling crime and violence and general moral uh, decadence among our youth in the country. Speaking, okay. speaking about outside um, in influence, uh, I want to come to you, Dr. Abiri, for this one. And it's the red pill content that we've seen on social media repeatedly. We have seen it so much so that it is, you know, heart wrenching to look at. Um, so I want to talk about social media in and of itself and how it influences, especially the young boys and this sort of rhetoric that is being, you know, portrayed on social media and the glorification, glorification of violence and glorification of misogynoir so to speak, for women. So it's rather unfortunate that the environment has and continues to become permissive with what we allow to slide. That's the word, yeah. permissive. Yeah, extremely permissive as to what we allow to slide. You know, um, a few days ago, and I know that, you know, this is also on social media where, you know, an actress, or rather a Nigerian musician, female, had said something like, stop raping us. And, you know, the response was, uh, then watch what you wear. And so it's, it's heartbreaking that, you know, children, Again, if you go beyond the screens, I always say that people are beyond screens, many times broken screens, many people who can't even step up to you on a regular. And because of the flawed you know, pa thought patterns that you've had, because of the flawed, so again, let's go back to the family, dysfunctional families, absent fathers, um, homes where you know, perhaps mothers are not present, either because of you know, circumstances or situations beyond the control. And so children have to grow up in many places, you know, having multiple caregivers, not having consistency, stability, the safety and security that a home is supposed to have. Again, research will show you that if you looked at criminals as against people who don't you know, have any crime you know, in their DNA, what you find is that the home system where everything starts is faulty. Sometimes you may even say that, okay, they have, there's a father and there's a mother. What role do they play in these children's lives? But, but doctor, there are times where, um, the, I mean, for example, this uh, story that's now on social media of, of Christiana who went to church and there's also the boy who's also in church and is a church member. And so there are times where you see the individual and the perpetrator of this crime is literally from a good background. I mean, it exactly. seems like is, it is appears it good on paper. Society? So it's something like, is it family or society? Because the mother is there, is present, you know, he has an older mm -hmm. brother who's doing well, or an elder sister who's married, and he seems to be on a path, on a, a, on a straight he's path. Set right. that is good, you know, set right. He's going to church, he's in school, they're friends. Yeah. He offered to help her, to be a gentleman, only to kill her. Well, so again, appearances can be deceitful, and many times are deceitful. Everything looks all right. Everything looks like we have a father and a mother, but what values are they giving onto that child? Then, of course, we have to look at the fact that there's, an, there's always an interplay between nature and nurture. What family did I come from? What, what you know, societal influences am I seeing? And so it's not until we get to social media. Even things as seemingly little as video games, the violence that we expose children to, the environments that they grow up in, and, of course, the permissiveness, again, of social media. 
The permissiveness of social media, if you ask me, is driven to a large extent by the fact that the people who seem to have a huge following, regardless of what they say, whether it is morally wrong, again, societal standards. What does society see as morally wrong? What does society see as, you know, right? And so, for instance, you'd hear people, you know, come across and say, oh, um, the reason why people go to Yahoo is because, oh, our forefathers were taken as slaves. It's a mentality that has been sold constantly to people. And until we go back to the drawing table, again, I would always take it back home, until we start to have, you know, values that make sense, values that we can uphold. People can, you know, have role models that they can look forward to until society, well, is no longer standing on its head. We may just continue to get it uh, wrong. Um, Mr. David, let, let me come to you and ask about this society, because <laughs> me, my own, I mean, I would draw from my own experience in seeing people around me. That's the only way I can, you know, form in, in opinions, right? And I've seen a situation where, you know, everything is right. You went to the best school, you went to the best, you had the best education, you know, had the best parent that one could possibly <coughs> ask for. You were given, you know, the best that society wants for you to have. But then you grow up and you decide to chart another yes. course for yourself differently from what it is. You know, and that is peer pressure in and of itself. And so I want you to speak on that one. But also, has society lost its plot? Uh, thank you very much. I think um, in asking that question, you just summarized uh, my own background. Because uh, I grew up in a loving home with uh, Christian parents. Uh, Dr. Abiri knows some of some or most of my story. I went to Christian schools all through, went to a good Christian private university, went to a good uh, university in London for my master's, and then still I, I got I got uh, mixed up with the wrong crowd and started using drugs. And then for seven years I was uh, struggling with addiction to hard drugs, you know, and that could have gone very, you know, that could have gone very south because uh, at some point I started living in the trap houses where. I had people who were criminals, who were kidnappers, who were armed robbers, who would go out to do anything to use on drugs. And David could just have gone out with any of these people and I'll have become one of those stories. And it would just be almost what you're talking about. He grew up in a loving home. He grew up in a Christian, Christian background, went to the best of schools. How did it happen? Uh, I think there are other predisposing factors. There are other underlining factors. You talked about peer pressure. Um, as Dr. Abiri has said, it still comes down to the home and instilling resilience, instilling uh, values, uh, instilling life skills and social skills in our children that will make them, uh, you know, make it, put them on the right track. Because I always tell people, no matter how, where you grow up, once you go out and you socialize, you're going to be... Uh, you're going to be exposed to substances and other social vices. So um, I'll take a leap from what Dr. Abiri is saying. It still boils down to the home. You know, that's the whole nature of us, not your thing. But once you are cooked properly, like I like to tell people, from the home, it makes it a lot more difficult for you to lose your way when you get out there. Because that really was my story. You know, that really was my story. You just summarized my story in the question that you asked. Mm -hmm. And I, mean, um, so I lost four friends, you know, to substance use, addiction, and other uh, related issues. But uh, thankfully to God, I'm here, I'm alive today, I'm telling my story, and I'm able to help others come out oh, of it. Oh, thank goodness. Your second question about if society has lost the plot, I think it's yes. You know, our... We lost okay. become so morally bankrupt. He was telling me he ran into an old, the younger sister of an old school mate. And she saw him and she just said, ah, ah, um, please, I would like, do you have any friends that can take care of me? And I, I kept on, it, it gave me sleepless night because I said, why would you just see somebody you haven't seen in so long and you're asking if he has any friends that can take care of you? Your parents are alive. Your parents sent you to a good school. You are in 400 level of university. Everything is going on well for you. But then you still think it's okay to just meet a stranger, you know, just so he can take care of you. And that's where some of these things start. You saw what happened in Kwara State with the young lady who went out to act as a boyfriend and uh, eventually died. And then that's something about 15,000 Naira was involved. I wonder, I wonder how or how her parents must be feeling at this time. So I think, yes, the society has lost this, the plot. Mm -hmm. uh, our moral values has depleted so badly that everything is upside down. You know, right is now wrong. Uh, and the people that the young ones look up to for help, 
you know the ones that we call our role models are glorifying some of these things you know on social media in their music videos and some of the videos that uh, they shoot and things Dr. like that Falani, so, uh something needs to be done something yeah. really really needs to be done I needed it to really jump does in there. start with the family regarding something needing to be done the question is rehabilitation now not just rehabilitation for those who are hooked on substance but rehabilitation for those who perhaps might have committed these crimes without the use of substance there's also the topic uh, or the subject of underage people who have committed these crimes how can they also be rehabilitated i'll take your uh, response to that first before dr bonjabrala's uh, okay thank you very much um yes there's need for rehabilitation there's need for corrective measures uh then there's need for uh, proper reintegration back into the society but these things have to be done uh oh with evidence-based procedures so you just don't uh, set up a facility and say you are you are rehabilitating people i've seen this done in so many places and it's become counterproductive because what is supposed to be done is not being done there you you for instance you talked about underaged uh, persons who need rehabilitation and then you take them to a facility without a child psychologist and uh, things like that you use uh, primitive measures or measures that uh, do not actually are not actually known to work to do these things and you find out that it's counterproductive sometimes they come out and they are worse so yes there's a need for that but um the the relevant stakeholders need to come together to make sure that this is done correctly so we don't have a bigger problem on our hands. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bonjubala, if yeah. you would like to respond to that now. Well, so it's important to have a plan and a plan that will work. I've worked, I've had, you know, the opportunity to work in some institutions where some of these underage people are kept, kept for reformation, rehabilitation, and... You know, when I had to do research, I did a research on trauma, even within the system. Mm. <laughs> so you, you need to, you know, be pretty sure that the system is not even re-traumatizing these ones mm. that we have put to get, you the know. stories of yeah. people being beaten, being and, chained. In fact, you know, you, you, don't want to, you don't want to imagine what's there. And so beyond structures, beyond processes that are touted out and, you know, told to us that, oh, don't worry, everything is going on right. Are we actually doing the work that they, needs to be done? Again, we need to go back home. I always say we need to go back home because, you know, even in making decisions as to who to marry, how many children I need to have, who will cater to my children when I'm not there. If there's a, you know, um, there's a life event such as death, who will cater to my children? Then you then go to, you know, the systems that have been put in place by other individuals, NGOs and governmental agencies. Do they have, do they have the expertise to run these places? Unfortunately, you know, everything, especially because of all the, all the Japa syndrome and all yeah. of those things, the experts that are needed to cater to the children are not even there. I'm you know, there, there was a day I was in a, one of these homes, and, you know, and when I had told them that this child was high risk, high risk for suicide, high risk for depression, when the head of that home came. So, blood of Jesus, we're in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. I was <laughs> cringing at how she was speaking to the child. She was like, are you mad? I'm like, no. What is wrong with you? What this you child mean? is supposed to be here to get reformed, to get rehabilitated. And like David said, when they get back out, they're most likely 10,000 times worse yes. than, you know, when they got back I in. Mean, so we all need to go back to the yeah. drawing table. It's, it's a lot of work for all of us. All hands must be on deck. But speaking of going back to the drawing table, I wonder if, our, if Nigeria and its glorification of riches and wealth mm. has also contributed to moral decay as well and what we see with our young boys. Uh, but... We're pressed for time. We have to go. But Dr. Abiri, I want to say thank, thank you, you so much. much. And also uh, to Falarami. David uh, for Laramie. We want to say thank you, both of you, for coming in and just giving very insightful conversation. It's very clear that this type of discussions cannot come to an end. It's an ongoing conversation that continues to be had and be had right here. Uh, and uh, just to, to create platforms to continue to advocate for a change in our moral systems. Well, that's all we can take for our extra special time for us to switch gears to Wellness Central. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and while we're on the topic of health, let's talk about hypertension. Commonly known as high blood pressure, it remains a significant health challenge, particularly among men. Now, it is a condition where the force of blood against the walls of the arteries is consistently too high, leading to a range of serious health issues, including heart disease, stroke, and also kidney damage. Recent studies, such as those outlined in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and also Metabolism, underscore the importance of understanding the underlying mechanism of hypertension and its prevalence among different populations, 
In men, hypertension is often linked to lifestyle factors such as poor diet, lack of exercise, and high stress levels, which can exacerbate the condition and lead to more severe health complications if care not taken. And in Nigeria, the rising cases of hypertension among men are a growing concern, reflecting a broader trend of increased cardiovascular risks in the population. Now, this trend highlights a need for effective public health strategies and also individual preventive measures. Addressing hypertension involves not only medical management, but also lifestyle modifications and public awareness campaigns. And so today, we're joined by Dr. Oro Luwa Joshua. He's a distinguished medical doctor with extensive experience in managing and researching hypertension. Dr. Joshua's insight will be very valuable as we delve into the rising cases of hypertension in Nigerian men and sometimes women. Well, mm -hmm. doctor, you're welcome to the program. Thank you so much for coming on. Let, yeah, let's uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're pressed for time, so let's get started, shall we? The primary factors contributing to the rising incidences of hypertension that we've seen among Nigerian men. What are the causes? What, what's the, what are the contributing factors? Yeah. So hypertension itself, um, there are what we call modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors for hypertension. Um, the modifiable risk factors, they are the ones that you can change. Um, they are usually related to habits, feeding habits, um, social habits, for example, smoking, alcoholism, um, some diet, then excess of salt intake. All of these can predispose people to the modifiable risk factors for hypertension. Then the non-modifiable risk factors are those that are largely genetic, uh, something people inherit from their parents. So if any of their parents were hypertensive, then there is a high chance that such individuals are also hypertensive. Then there are other certain conditions that can predispose people to hypertension, for example, kidney disease, some hormonal conditions. So these are the few. Right, but in know. men, largely, Modifiable risk factors, drinking, smoking, diet, these are the major culprits for hypertension. Yeah. Now, I want to go back to what you just said about men and the major culprits being drinking and also smoking. Now, for Nigerians who are going through such a tough time with increasing hikes of prices of this and that, we just spoke about medicine this morning. For them, the favorite pastime for most people is in the evening to perhaps take one or two drinks here and there. And of course, also indulge in other habits that might not be necessarily to their advantage. So how exactly do these habits contribute to hypertension if they're supposed to actually relax um, men during their pastimes? Okay, great. Well... I'm hoping we'll we still have doctor him, yeah. there. <laughs> you see your question. You do understand why yeah, I'm asking no, this question in these times. Uh, but, you I, know, I, I look forward even to Even the every conditions that's why you know, we put you in hypertension. Yeah, <laughs> personally, I look forward to Sunday evenings because Sunday evenings are our Friday evenings. And then that gives me the opportunity to find one or two friends who are able to hang yeah, out with me and just have a pleasurable time together. Yeah, how about you but, go for brunch? How about you do that? Well, yeah, well, you have to understand that it's not the same. It's a culture that we have in Nigeria, <laughs> apart from the community, apart from meeting with a friend yeah. and sharing. And you can have stories. a boozy brunch. You can too. have one of those um, um, uh, beverages that mm. you know, refresh you, not only refresh you, but also vitalizes you. <laughs> but the vitality here is a question. Like, is it really getting... vitalizing? Yeah, oh, is it? <laughs> so the question is, uh, maybe I was going to go to the point of asking what alternatives people could yeah, indulge in that indulge are equally in. as, yeah. uh, but without the uh, health risks. Yeah. I'm very, very, it's unfortunate that uh, Dr. Oroluwa is unable to join us back, but we really had some very interesting questions to ask mm. him regarding this. But I'm sure that he's going to be joining us before the end of I'm, the show also, here today. I also would like to talk about the genetic disposition, predisposition of it as well. Um, you know me about not sharing certain things, but I worry about that as well and how because of sometimes we don't go for testing, mm -hmm. sometimes we don't know our personal family history. It's called Some a person, silent killer for it, a reason. Boom, it's a silent killer for a reason because you don't even know to begin with. Or maybe, maybe you know you just don't want to. You, you just don't want to put a name to it. Because of our religious, uh, religious, how religious Jesus we are. Uh, Jesus is Viela. I am healed in the mighty name of you know, yeah, or well, when okay, someone yeah. is literally stro he, uh, very sick and you call them, it's like, hey, how are you doing? That one goes, oh, I'm mm. strong. I'm very strong. 
Dr. Oreolua is back with I'm us, I'm strong. being told. Dr. Oreolua, I'm, my apologies. Please go ahead and continue with your response. Yeah, so people in the evenings, they try to relax using uh, drinking, uh, smoking, um, eating, all sorts of things that are unhealthy for their bodies. Now, for example, smoking itself causes direct damage to blood vessels to the walls of the arteries, and the body tries to compensate for that. Uh, then this leads to hypertension because when the arteries are damaged, there is reduced blood flow to the organs that need this blood flow. So the body tries to compensate. So the heart tries to pump, you know, blood to get to those organs. And in the middle of doing this, then there is increased, you know, blood pressure. And over time, or when it becomes persistent, it leads to hypertension. And same thing with alcoholism. In alcoholism, uh, the body tries to compensate for the excess damage caused by, you know, alcohol and that can also lead to hypertension itself. Um, well, and people, it's quite difficult because you keep telling people alcohol, smoking, but that's about the only thing that people use in relaxing themselves in the evening when they get back from their jobs. Uh, before uh, you went off there, myself and Mazuno was having conversations about, you know, hypertension and its place amongst our people and it being a silent killer. But I also wonder about the genetic predisposition role uh, of this, how it plays in the development of hypertension. What do, you know, Nigerians need to know, especially men, you know, who do not know a bit of their family, health history? Mm -hmm. How do you know if you're genetically predisposed to yeah. it? And if you are... You know, what type what of treatment, do. what is your lifestyle change, what should you be doing to, you know, be able to take care of yourself? Okay, great. So, people generally should ask their parents or watching their parents grow and seeing how that their parents struggle with hypertension. Then such an individual should be more careful about their health. And especially when they start growing old, getting to the age of 40 and above, they should start checking their blood pressure because they can just all of a sudden discover that there is a rise in their blood pressure and when it becomes persistent, it leads to hypertension. So what, what these individuals should do, especially if they have noticed that their dads or their moms had hypertension, uh, they can begin to modify their diet. For example, if there are people who are used to putting extra salt in their food, then they have to cut that down. In fact, generally, you should cut down salt intake. Because salt intake is one of the factors that is exposed to hypertension. Then they can also reduce the intake of fatty foods. Right? Fatty foods can lead to buildup of fats in the blood vessels, a condition called atherosclerosis. And this can also lead to hypertension. All right? So they can cut down on fatty foods. Then also exercise. What exercise does is that it increases you know, the flow of blood within the blood vessels in the arteries and the veins. And how this helps individuals is that if there is going to be any build up of something usually fat related cholesterol in the blood, exercise, when you exercise, your heart beats faster, it helps to clear the blood vessels that clog. Then also avoiding smoking, avoiding alcohol, all of these things can help especially when people, you know that your parents struggled with hypertension, but it's important that you pick it up early. Then having done all these things, and people still discover that at 40 years or 50 years, they are said to notice signs of hypertension, uh, they are having headaches, you know, having chest pain, and check their blood pressure is elevated above 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. And they have applied all of this, you know, practices, um, watching their lifestyle, um, exercising, cutting down on salt intake, and they still observe that blood pressure is going up then, they should quickly seek the attention of a doctor. The doctor would most likely put them on blood pressure medication. And blood pressure medication is not a death sentence, like many persons would think, that once they start taking blood pressure drugs, then it means that their life is over. But there are people who have lived 25 years, 30 years, on blood pressure medications, having their blood pressure adequately controlled and they live very good and healthy life.
Uh, Dr. Aurelua, there's one thing that you just said that's very important. Now, people are scared to get on blood pressure medications because they believe that once they get on it, that's it. It's for life. So often they don't want to go to the hospital, so they are not um, made to start these medications. How firm is that fact? Is it a fact at all, or is it fallacy? Well, from practice, uh, people, once they start blood pressure medications, we, even we doctors, we tell them, you don't stop taking your blood pressure medications until we doctors tell you to modify right. it or change it. Or Yes. Um, I know many persons are scared of that, but it is just about the best way to get the blood pressure controlled. Okay, then, Dr. And uh, people, yeah, people need to... People, yeah. Yeah, my, my apologies. I just wanted you to end it there because we are out of time. I just wanted to mention um, yeah, that yeah, fact. People, people, need to, people need to learn. You know, when you start taking blood pressure medications, you are not going to die. The blood pressure medication is only saving your life. Because without the blood pressure medication, then you are at risk of dying from hypertension. But with right. the blood pressure medication, then you can have a very good quality life. It doesn't take so much from you. Um, as soon as you eat, take your blood pressure medication, I think that's the way we try to make them understand and get comfortable with taking blood pressure medication. All right. Thank you very well, much. Doctor, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise on this uh, important topic. And that's Dr. Orolua Joshua. And again, once again, many thanks. Thank you very much. Now, do stay tuned, yeah, viewers, because coming up, we have our final segment here, Focus Africa, coming your way for Breakfast Extra. Welcome back. And on Focus Africa segment today, the deepening economic ties between China and Africa. Just days ago, Chinese President Xi Jinping and Nigeria's President Bola Tinubu pledged to strengthen cooperation at the China-Africa Business Summit. The two leaders outlined a vision for closer collaborations uh, in trade, infrastructure and also technology investments and signaling a new chapter in bilateral relations. Now, a move that has the potential to reshape Africa's economic landscape is what we see here on the brink of starting. Now, with China already one of Nigeria's biggest trading partners, this renewed commitment to deeper economic ties could open doors to significant investments, particularly in sectors like manufacturing, energy, and even technology and not just for Nigeria, but Africa as a whole. But while these high-level agreements sound promising, the real question is how much of this will trickle down to the benefit of the average man? Will it help tackle issues like unemployment and economic stability, to say? So, indeed, while leaders are optimistic, there are still concerns about how Africa, particularly in this case Nigeria, can also leverage this relationship without becoming overly reliant on China. So to help us unpack the key outcomes of this summit and what it could mean for Africa and Nigeria, we're joined by, uh, well, the uh, very interesting Agogo here in the studio from Naira Metrics. Um, Agogo, you're welcome. Good to have you here. Thank you for having Agogo, me. Agogo, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. I have a very peculiar question to ask. Are we loaning Nigeria or Africa to the Chinese? Uh, not really. Not really. It depends on... <laughs> You're shaking your head, but it would seem so, wouldn't you it? Have been waiting to because if we have question. relationships with them that may, mean that they're going to come over and help put infrastructure in place and with their own personnel... Uh, well, it's, they can't do it overly with their own personnel. I think uh, we also have Africans working in Chinese establishments in Nigeria mm -hmm. and even uh, China-backed infrastructure projects. You see uh, a lot of Africans work. We might have uh, technical personnel from China perhaps due to their level of education and uh, technological advancement, they might have more people with deep insight into these uh, technological or engineering designs. But mm -hmm. we see a lot of Nigerians and Africans working in their projects, although not in really advanced roles, but people earn a living from these mega projects across Africa. So what are the, 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 the key major economic takeaways from this summit, China, Africa, business, especially for Nigeria? Okay, a, a lot of Nigerian uh, businesses uh, were exposed or met uh, Chinese uh, counterparts in, in China. I think uh, a few of them signed some deals. Uh, the Lagos State government also entered into some memorandum of understanding with uh, uh, some companies, infrastructure companies in China. And broadly for Africa, we also saw uh, the Chinese uh, president, Xi Jinping, 
uh, promised up to 50, 51 billion uh, dollars in uh, investment in Africa. Some come with investment, some come with uh, as loans, Aha. and all of that. So, mm. so and interestingly, I think uh, unlike uh, three years ago when uh, these deals were in U.S. dollars, I think they are trying to structure this deal in the Chinese currency. Ah, okay. this time. So mm. we're seeing a shift in <clears throat> in forex now, instead of it being the dollars. Yeah. Going to, but however, you use the word loan, and that was the first word I started with. We're going to have to pay back somehow. And a long how, how's that going to cost the African countries? Because Chinese isn't doing this, you know, for free. Well, they, this, yeah. These loans, they are long term and usually low interest. Chinese loans to Africa are usually long term, 30, 40 years loans. And they are usually interest between 1% to 3%. Sorry, have you met Nigeria? <laughs> because one dispensation doesn't mean that it carries through into the other one, whatever oh, contracts Manzino, were signed government from before. Oh, government is continuum. They will pay it now. So no, definitely. In the case of Nigeria, for instance, how, does, how is that going to impact the future mm. generation if these loans are that, uh, uh, span that long? No, the hope, the hope is that uh, investment in infrastructure will catalyze uh, trade and businesses, which we generate revenue for government in the long run. No country, I don't, there are very few countries that can do without loans. You just need loans. A lot of countries owe a lot. And uh, you just keep servicing it, pay, 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 and all of that. Hmm. Uh, I think um, the, the loans used to rebuild Europe in 1945 after the Second mm -hmm. World War, I think we finally paid around 2005, mm -hmm. 2006. So long-term loans, they are beneficial for country. People benefit, it's not like you just you can't do, we don't have the resources. So, so besides the investments and besides the, the, the loan, or rather, rather the, the, the investment that yeah. you know, the China has decided to give to Africa, it looks advantageous, but are there disadvantages to it besides re, uh, you know, the lump sum you know, burden of having to repay them? Uh, yes, the, the burden of repayment is, is technically a disadvantage. We've seen... Uh, uh, debt programs that have caused crisis across Africa in recent time. The major example is Kenya, when they try to restructure their debts and say, okay, let us raise revenues, taxing and, taxes and all of that. And we saw yeah, the protests that protest came out after that. And there have also been calls for some form of debt relief for African countries, but I think that has not been heeded uh, by the Chinese. I think uh, the president during his address to the 50 or something African leaders that were present there, didn't uh, state that. It didn't state anything relating to debt relief, although there have been calls from international organizations like that there should be debt relief for some African countries, but that hasn't materialized for now. So besides just the, the debt uh, burden, you don't see any disadvantage to that $50 billion uh, dollars investment? I don't. It, you see, the particular um, projects they are going to be channeled into have not really been identified or explicitly stated, so mm -hmm. we cannot see, mm -hmm. we cannot determine the but success likely, or failure of those. Likely these would be in what form? Would it be in terms of infrastructural investments? Yes, yeah, so mostly the Chinese investments are mostly infrastructural. Mm. Yes. Build your roads, mm. build your big bridges, build your ports. Yes. Mm. Africa needs infrastructure. If you want to if you want to boost trade and commerce and you want to industrialize the continent, you definitely need infrastructure. So have Chinese loans worked in any known instance, any country? where they are enjoying these Chinese loans? Apart from the, uh, the African instance, has, has, has there no, been... You know, China just, just uh, gained this international prominence in recent time, and I think they launched this uh, Belt and Road Initiative where they plan to invest a lot across different countries. Mm. So we can't really judge. It's still early days it's for the early Chinese. Stage. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, we're pressed for time, so my, this, I'm sure, is going to be the last question, and it's about, you know, the partnership and its influence in Nigeria. How do you see this partnership influencing Nigeria's role on the global economic stage, especially in balancing relationships with both, not China, and the Western countries? And you know the bilateral issues between China and... China doesn't really have uh, any problem with Nigeria or its uh, trade partners mm -hmm. having trade relations with other countries. Right. To a large extent, they, they take a very neutral stance mm -hmm. on, uh, should I say, controversial, foreign policy issues or international mm. diplomatic issues. They take a somewhat neutral stance. So right. that, that's, that not a problem on Nigeria's relations with other countries. So, so far, so good. All is well in the House of Commons. Until. Uh, until. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Agogo, thank you very much for coming through from Naira Metrics. Always thank a pleasure to have you here. Yeah. Come give us some definition to all the numbers and also uh, deals that are signed 
yeah. by different countries. And to our guests, or rather our viewers as well, who have sat since yesterday to see news, um, uh, us bring all the news items from during the week here on Breakfast Extra. Thank you very much. Oh, there was one thing I really wish we had. I was about. Uh, smiling. <laughs> and it's your cousin. Ngalali resigned yesterday, or was it on Friday? We had hopes that we'd talk about it today, but Judith is very excited about the story. We are yet to find out exactly why, but he mentioned health issues. But he's just such a very unique personality that I thought that he added some panache to the media team of the president. And without him, it would be sad to see him go. And I wonder who's going to take that position and whether it's going to be as entertaining as uh, Ngalali. Now, if you're a first time viewer here, you, when you hear Mazzino say my cousin, please don't think we're related. <laughs> um, he's only my cousin in the family. He's in as the much a cousin as we is my, 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 my uncle. There we go. uncle. <laughs> uh, so we, we, what we mean is in the family of light-skinned uh, individuals is my cousin, you know, because we're yeah. all light-skinned. You know what I mean? So that's what it is for our first time viewers. But again, our heart goes out to uh, um, um, Mr. Ngalali. We really do understand that if taking indefinite leave to go take care of your family, a leave of absence is very important. Let it be and, so. And let it be so. Let it be that. And um, yeah, so uh, all the best to him. And uh, all the way, well done again for your service to Nigeria, public service to Nigeria. And I'll keep it at that. Well, it's goodbye from us. We'll see you next week, Saturday. you see our faces throughout the entire course of the week. But uh, we'll be back on set right here to bring you another Breakfast Extra on Saturday, 8 a.m. Until then, bye for now. Yellow! <laughs> everybody say yellow! Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody.